What's up, peers, and welcome to join the Wasabi Cast, a Bitcoin privacy podcast. Today, with the one and only Rusty Russell, who has been contributing to free software projects since, well, a very long time.、Uh, he started all the way to contributing to the Linux kernel itself.、Uh, so, one of the very core projects that advanced the ethos of free software tremendously. And we have a conversation of how he experienced those contributions back in the days. And how he now applies the learnings from these days to his current contributions to Bitcoin and especially the Lightning Network, where he has now for the last six years been tinkering on making this crazy idea a reality.、Uh, he is one of the first guys to take this idea and actually write a implementation, what is now known as C Lightning, that does all this crazy channel and routing magic that the Lightning Network is known for. And in today's conversation, we again speak a lot about his、uh, hurdles and problems in in the methodology of of working together and under this free software project. But then, of course, also how we can get technically more sophisticated with using this technology. So, how can we update the specification and the implementations with new features? For example, offers which he has invented that are. A, a much more powerful way to request to be paid,、uh, with things like recurring payments,、uh, even items,、uh, price conversions, currency exchange rates, and all of these things added together in one nice standardized way. So this has been a long conversation, but a very in-depth one that I've enjoyed very much. Rusty is really one of those heroes in the Bitcoin cyberspace. Who have done an incredible amount of work, and we are for sure standing on the shoulders of giants like him、uh, every day when we use the Bitcoin Lightning Network right now.、Uh, so, without any further ado, here is the, my conversation with Rusty Rosal. So, Rusty, I'm very happy that you joined me for this conversation today.、Uh, you've really been a, a pioneer、uh, in Lightning Network, and to start off this conversation, I'm just so curious. With six years ago, be- before you got into the Lightning Network, like. What was your understanding of of Bitcoin back then, and where did you see some of the big problems that needed to be solved at that point? Wow. Okay. So,、um, firstly, thanks. Yeah, it's it's good to be on. So yeah,、uh, six years ago, I, oh, I guess we go. We have to go back like you know seven or eight years really when I was first. I mean, I'd I'd heard of Bitcoin. I read the white paper probably, I don't know, two thousand and eleven. I guess. And you know it's a very easy read. And I thought, okay, well this is kind of interesting. And I was always interested in, in different open source projects, right? Doing doing different stuff, and this seemed kind of ambitious. You know, I, this the cypherpunk stuff、um, and cryptography generally has always kind of been like a side interest of mine. So you know, I was kind of in that vein that I I looked at you know, this cool open source project trying to make open source money. And I think I bought some I bought some Bitcoin early on just to you know and spent it all on. Random stuff like, hey, let's buy some play money and and send it around and do stuff like that. So I sort of had a reasonable understanding, I guess, of Bitcoin leading up to that, and that coincided with me, you know, obviously realizing that that it, you know the, the main issue was always going to be the scalability problem. And so, <laughs> you know, I was kind of working on this on the side. I had a day job doing a Linux kernel development, and it was actually my wife who said I was much nicer to live with when I was working on something I was passionate about, and she convinced me to take a six month sabbatical. From from、uh, kernel work,、um, and work on a project which is basically a side chain.、Um, it's called Petty Coin. The word side chain hadn't been invented yet, but it was basically you know we, it's a side chain. It's exactly what let's call it today, which would be much easier to explain than trying to convince people that I wasn't writing an old coin.、Uh, but the idea was you transfer you know petty cash from the main Bitcoin network onto this network, which gave you lower security guarantees, but ideally higher throughput. And then that would be like your spending money. And then you know, if you got enough there, you'd kind of transfer it back onto the Bitcoin network where it was it was safer. So I guess that was my my interest in in Bitcoin. And towards the end of that that sabbatical, Blockstream dropped their sidechains paper, and I'm like, well, sh- crap.、Uh, this is this is what I was trying to implement. I really wish you'd drop this at the beginning and not the end of my sabbatical. So they reached out to me and said, hey, we should talk. 
And shortly after that, I ended up joining Blockstream. Um, but in that, that, that period between the end of my sabbatical and, and then switching to Blockstream, uh, the lightning paper dropped, right? And so here I was, you know, digging into my, you know, rusty C++ skills to kind of, you know, work on, on, on Bitcoin Core, because I assumed that that was what I would be doing with Blockstream. Kind of, you know, Greenfield's project, something I hadn't done before, it was kind of cool. And Greg Maxwell, then CTO, uh, after I'd kind of went across and visited for about a month, said, well, why don't you go implement Lightning? Because at the time, um, the paper had dropped, but there was no intention to actually implement it. So it seemed like something that somebody should do. And I kind of felt a bit of bait and switch there, right? Because I was really looking forward to working with, you know, the Bitcoin core team and kind of getting involved in the Bitcoin project itself. But, you know, having written by that stage, the explainer that a lot of people use to actually read the, the original lightning paper, because it was, it was kind of a dense read. Uh, and so I'd written this set of blog posts on kind of just deconstructing the paper, kind of the primer on how to read it. Um, and, and yeah, so it seemed too good an opportunity to, to pass up. I mean, somebody had to do it, right? So I actually ended up writing the first lightning implementation as it was, uh, and then stepping into uh, a role for standardizing the different implementations that, that, uh, that came about around that time. So I guess that gives sort of an intro to, to kind of how I, how I got into Bitcoin and, and then, you know, and, and then into lightning. Oh, really fascinating. And lots of things to unpack here. One thing that I would like to find out about your foundations uh, is your Linux kernel uh, background. Like, why did you get interested in that and what were your tasks there? Oh, wow. Um, so I was interested in Linux when I was in university. So uh, I played with Linux at the time. We, we were, I was always a Unix person. So uh, we had Sun machines. And then my first job, um, I moved into a job and they didn't have an internet connection at all. And I was like, wow, we really should do this. So I had a friend at the university set up a modem and we used uh, a spare PC as a Linux box to, to route things. And for that was the first time they ever got email. Um, and that was a, that was a um, mining software company that I was working for. So, um, so that was sort of my first, you know, I, I played with Linux um, at university and it was crap, right? I mean, I had access to sun machines, but I could, you know, install Linux and, you know, you could, oh, I'm root, uh, that's cool. And with my eight meg of RAM, you could kind of run X, <laughs> wrap an X clock and an X term, and then that was about it. So, um, and my machine was flaky. So of course, you know, it didn't stay out very long. It was kind of like, oh, this is crap. Um, I'll stick with real Unix. Um, so I kind of got into that. And then um, it was actually 1997 when I went to a conference called Usenix, which was the big Unix conference in the world. Um, and this year they had a use Linux track. So, uh, so this, they, they had actually got this, you know, this, this up and coming newfangled Unix clone Linux, and they had, um, you know, Linus Torvalds and, and David Miller and a whole pile of the, you know, Alan Cox, the, the, the key, the key, um, Linux people, um, basically had, had come to this conference, uh, to talk about Linux and, um, I thought, well, that was a really good opportunity. I'll, I'll go across, uh, to Anaheim, California to, to, to attend this conference. And I went to a couple of talks, but a particular talk about porting Linux to the UltraSpark. So the machines, you know, that I was familiar with the Sun machines and things, and it was given by Dave Miller. And, uh, it was probably the most inspiring computing talk, uh, well, definitely the most inspiring computing talk I've ever been to. Unfortunately, it wasn't recorded, but Dave Miller, this kind of like daggy looking student kind of guy, um, gave this talk on, on, on basically effectively in many ways, beating Solaris, beating Sun on their own hardware, uh, with his Linux port that he had done in his sort of spare time as a student. And, you know, it shifted my worldview. I, when I went into that conference, I still had this idea about how software was produced, right? Software is produced by big companies and big teams of, you know, uh, inspired programmers producing this, you know, these, these gems of software that they ship out to the world. Um, the idea that this sort of random group of people across the internet could produce something that was hell, that was even close to usable, let alone something that was competitive and even better than the stuff coming out of that sort of, you know, hierarchical system was something that didn't even occur to me. But by the time I left, I realized that, that my whole worldview had shifted. I realized that this is, this is the way great software is, is going to be produced. And more importantly, that this, this was what I wanted to do, right? I wanted to 
work with with this group of people. I want to work with people doing this this kind of stuff. Um, you know, and so when I got home, I I basically you know I had some kernel patches that I've been working on, just little hacks and things, and basically started polishing them off. And and I put some working my spare time, put them together, and um, submitted them. It turns out to David Miller, who as well as the UltraSpark port was in charge of Linux networking at the time. Um, and one day he took my patches and ripped out the old code I'd replaced and that's it. I was Linux firewall maintainer from then on. And, Amazing. you know, and then the next year I went back to the conference and um, I pitched to someone who was looking to hire someone. I said, I don't want to work for you, but I've got this new project to like make the Linux firewall even better. So if you pay, it's going to take me, but it's going to take me six months. So sorry, it's going to take me 12 months. Um, but if you pay me, if you send me money, I don't have to have a day job and I can probably complete it in six. Um, and I, I was amazed that they actually went for that. Right. And so <laughs> they, ended up, they ended up basically, you know, um, sending me money for it turned out to be 12 months because software, um, while I worked on this, this next, next generation of firewalling stuff. Um, and from there, I just, I, I was, so, so pretty much since 1998, I was full-time employed as a free software programmer working on Linux and had never worked on proprietary software since. So that, um, uh, that was kind of what, what got me in and, um, Linux of course was this poster child for open source software, right? Um, a lot of other projects came up. Um, and so I was kind of interested in, you know, what are other projects doing? What are other open source projects doing? Um, Linux was very polished, very, um, um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of senior practical kind of people, uh, working on it. So a lot of really good procedures, basically techniques for doing things and stuff like that, that I think, you know, has sort of given a lot to those working in, in open source, because and there are some, some things about the kernel development process that I really like. It scales remarkably well, um, and has a, has a really cool kind of dynamic to it. That's been worked out over the last 20 years. So, you know, um, I always look around at new projects and see what they're doing. And there was a similar vibe to Bitcoin in the early Linux days. You know, it was the same thing. Like this was not, this is not how you produce software, right? is very much the early, all the early Bitcoin vibe of this is not how you make money, right? This is not, this is not where money comes from, right? You know, this is, this is not how it's done. And that sort of level of ambition, I think is something that really attracted me to the Bitcoin space, right? Doing something, uh, in, in, as a community that, that people don't think of as possible, right? This is not how a currency is made. I mean, that's, that's not how, not how, not how money works. And it's interesting because of course, in the early Linux days, there are a number of people like, well, you know, it's not a real Unix, it's not real software, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and th there were a lot of perfectly valid points on why it wasn't right. Who am I going to get support from? You know, um, how, how can I trust renders on the internet to write my mission critical software? And what's really interesting to me is that we never found a good answer to that. What happened is that it became almost compulsory, right? So. Uh, if you were in, if you were in an IT department, the, the people who believe that software had to produce that way retired, you know, um, and other people who understood that this was the way software was produced, just took their place. And we never really got a good answer. Like who, how can you trust renders over the internet to produce software? But in the end of the day, it didn't matter because it was simply better and it was there and it was ready when people needed it. But that process took 20 years. So, you know. When I look at Bitcoin, I kind of look at it as through the same kind of lens, right? You know, it, it will not meet all the criticisms that people have of it, but ideally it will have its niche and people will end up discovering, Hey, this thing is really useful. And, you know, progress is made as people age and retire, frankly, um, there'll be some people who will never come to Bitcoin and that's fine. You know, that's, that's just always the way it's been, right? Progress happens as, as more people, more new people come on the scene, uh, doing different things. So, you know, I guess the other important point along those lines is that in the early days of Linux, we knew exactly where we were going, right? Linux was going to go on the des desktop, right? It was us against Microsoft, right? Linux was going to be Linux versus windows was clearly the battle that was, that everyone was prepared for, right? And that was what we thought we were doing. Uh, it turns out we weren't right. It turns out we killed the other Unixes, but uh, we never defeated windows and you know, nonetheless, you know, Despite that, however, all top 500 of the, you know, the top 500 supercomputers in the world run Linux and, you know, uh, it's, it's probably the most widely distributed, um, operating system, certainly serious operating system, uh, high end operating system on the planet. 
of all the Android phones and everything else. So, you know, and a serious amount of the internet, you know, is, is served on Linux and that's just a given now. So, you know, uh, sometimes you win in ways that you don't expect and the obvious, the things you think that you're, you know, the, the battle that you think is coming is not the one that actually is there. So I guess the, the moral of that is that if you're producing something worthwhile, that you think is actually really useful, it will generally find a use. It just might not quite be what you were expecting it to be. And, you know, and progress of course will be uneven. I think, you know, it's really hard to predict the future and trying to say, well, this is where we're going is always a little bit fraught. What are some of the differences that you see between Unix or Linux and now Bitcoin? Well, it's interesting because from my experience with other open source projects, I really prefer like a hierarchical approach, right? It's good to have a boss, right? It's good to have somebody who is in charge of the project, sets the direction and makes decisions, right? Because sometimes you've got these debates, you know, should we do A or B, right? Which, which is the better way? And sometimes you know, developers don't agree, right? Not everyone agrees with it. And having somebody who goes, right, we're going this way. Sometimes it's nice to have an answer, even if that you don't agree with it, right? There are many times that I disagreed with Linus's. No, there weren't many times, but there are numerous times where I strongly disagreed with Linus's decisions, but he had a track record for being consistently, you know, correct far more than he was incorrect. Also the flexibility to change his mind if he was proven wrong later. And to some extent, Underneath the, the stuff that, that I maintained, you know, Linus didn't really get override. Um, so I was, I got to make my own architectural decisions within there, but, you know, I, and I really preferred that in projects. And I had a huge skepticism of projects that weren't run with sort of, you know, the founder kind of carries it along and, and makes these calls because it, it does simplify governance significantly. Um, Bitcoin obviously doesn't have that model and it, it works remarkably well. You know, I think part of that is that. In practice, there is a core group of Bitcoin developers who have been around for, for quite a long time. It'll be interesting to see what happens as they retire um, and we look in the longer term and they get replaced by people who haven't been there forever. Do they have the same kind of weight in decision-making? You know, what will happen when there are huge disagreements and things like that is, is, is kind of interesting. But, you know, I think to some extent there is, you know, Linux was still trying to figure out how to make software. You know, there's a whole heap of things that, that we take for granted now that we was, that we struggled with back in the day. You know, how, how do we make all this work? How, how do we have maintainers? How, who's in charge? What, what happens and stuff like that? All those things have kind of got norms now, which does make some things easier. On the other hand, you know, Bitcoin is a much more ambitious project, right? We're not just trying to make yet another thing like something that already exists, which is basically what Linux was trying to do. Uh, we're trying to make something really new and that is, is, you know, it is much more ambitious as a project. So it's going to have its own issues, but there's definitely echoes, right? There are some, there were some crises in the early days of Linux that no one remembers now, but they were huge at the time, you know, massive governance crises about how things would be run or how some you know, decisions were made or, or, or big, big things about, should we go this way or that way, uh, that are completely water under the bridge now. Uh, but at the time were, you know, hugely distressing and, and, and major, you know, uh, major crises in the project itself. Um, so I think that reassures me sometimes when we have, you know, the inevitable Bitcoin crises that, you know, once you've been through a crisis, once you have a bit more perspective over what it takes, you know, what happens and everything else, but your first crises are always, you know, uh, emotional and, and difficult and you don't, because you don't know what's going to happen. This whole thing could fall apart over this, you know, uh, random hard fork or whatever it is that's proposed. And so I think, you know, I see us on a similar kind of maturity path where we feel like, cool, okay, we've done this before. We kind of have a roadmap now on, on, on how this stuff happens. Um, so I do see that maturity process happening now um, in the Bitcoin space, which is, which is fairly reassuring. But, you know, different projects are different and Bitcoin has a whole pile of layers of things that are not you know, not directly computer science related, um, the whole uh, economic side and things like that, which which have their own significant part, right? Um, and, you know, and, and that that leads a whole different light. But we're also, we're also in a very different time, right? You know, instead of sort of slashed up, we've got Twitter and, and, and uh, kind of much more ferocious, I would say, almost gamed kind of weaponized social media and things like that, which I think make, project that's coming into its own as a higher profile project, more difficult and more stressful for the people involved. So I, I am slightly concerned that that 
you know, that will become a problem um, that, you know, it's not as easy as it used to be. You know, once it was a brace out of that core group of geeks who are hacking on something and think it's cool, you inevitably go through this transition where um, you're flooded by newbies. Um, and, you know, uh, uh, you, you get attacked, you know, you get attacked from, from, from all these directions from people. And that's just part of uh, the process um, that you inevitably go through as part of mainstreaming. And, you know, I, I think we're, we're seeing that now. Only a lot more people care about money than care about software. So Bitcoin's battle is proportionally much larger, I think. So with Linux and, uh, you know, other GNU Linux type operating systems, one easy solution to the governance is that you can fork off the code right, and create your own new project uh, and even inherit the, the future progress of the other work. Um, and in Bitcoin, there is there's seemingly the same thing that you could just fork the Bitcoin core code, change some parameters and the consensus rules, and then you spin off a new independent coin, a, a new network in and of itself, but maybe more nuanced we might have the same problem or, or the same situation inside the Bitcoin network with multiple consensus clients um, uh, running alongside each other. Now, on, on all these three levels of analysis, what, what do you think? Okay, so yeah, um, the you can always fork it thing is more difficult as the project gets more mature, independent of, of the whole uh, Bitcoin specific consensus issues. A project builds up infrastructure as it goes, right? In the case of the Linux kernel, all right, there's infrastructure around everything now. Um, it's, it's part of people's work pipelines. There's this distributions. There's, you know, they, they take the code released by Linux and they do things to it and they run it through tests. And you know, this, this infrastructure is, is significant, mostly invisible to people who don't know it, but has been developed over time and ritual and, and has a huge number of people involved and a lot of moving parts. You simply can't just reproduce it. You can't just, oh, I'm going to fork the Linux kernel today and expect to get anything. Right. In practice, it's so big um, that almost any fork is a non-starter, right? Um, and not just because th there's so much momentum. You know, so many people are going, even, even if even if Linus made some decision that 10% of people didn't like, that's not enough, right? You'd have to, you'd have to really piss off a huge number of people. Um, and then you would still have this massive momentum problem that all the infrastructure would have to be moved, right? Um, so unless it is so bad that everyone moves, it, it's it's just it's it's pretty much unworkable, right? Um, and it would be a huge, massive disruption to basically restart with all that infrastructure. Now, what's interesting is this is the same argument for Bitcoin. Bitcoin has a huge amount of infrastructure. That's its head start. That's why you can't just go, oh, I'm going to make a better Bitcoin and ship it, right? We rely on that infrastructure. But similarly, that means that you can't just you know tweak it and expect you can go off into the sunset independent almost of, of the fact there's also this consensus problem that you would immediately fork off the network and you'd be on your own. Now, the question of multiple implementations is interesting because when you look at the kind of the, the, the developer priorities for Bitcoin, for the, the, there's one that is above centralization, right? The, the decentralization is the second most important thing in Bitcoin. The most important thing in Bitcoin is that it work. And this is nowhere seen as clearly as the decision not to have basically multiple independent implementations, right? That would be more decentralized in many ways, right? It would avoid this whole Bitcoin core centralization issue. Um, but the risk to the network is probably too great. Now, at some stage, maybe we'll have a formal language that, you know, <laughs> that we can describe uh, the Bitcoin consensus algorithm in. And at that point, you can re-implement it with, with reasonable assurance that you're not going to just have a fork off the network and, and mess everything up uh, and take 30% of the nodes with you and stuff like that. Um, but until then, it's a safety question. And so this is one area where you know, central decentralization has taken a back seat to uh, the practical matter of making sure that everyone stays in consensus. Um, and that's just real world engineering, right? There are no absolutes. Uh, you do the best you can. Um, and we don't know have a good way of doing decentralized development. You know, uh, as long as we're still doing development, we are going to be somewhat centralized. The only way to really do decentralized is basically to freeze everything. We are never upgrading Bitcoin again. Um, at that point, it becomes practical, perhaps, to have multiple independent implementations of the same thing that you can prove against each other and stuff like that. Um, but uh, we're definitely not there yet. And so, you know, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea that, that we just are not good enough at writing software to have independent implementations 
running live on the Bitcoin network in critical areas, right? There are other implementations, but in practice, if they forked off, it would do very little economic harm and it certainly wouldn't disrupt most of the network, right? So, you know, uh, and I think it's, you know, it's healthy for those things to exist, but I do defer to um, the Bitcoin core developers who generally have the view that there are too many sharp edges and too many difficulties with trying to maintain consensus as it is uh, with a single implementation, um, let alone introducing multiple implementations. So, you know, and, and there's finite resources, right? How many implementations can you, can you have uh, at the same time and keep them all up to, up to date? Um, and, you know, if you look at the CVEs, the, the um, issue disclosures for Bitcoin Core, you see there's, you know, there's a lot of maintenance going on to just, just keep the ship afloat and keep it robust, right? Multiply that by the number of different implementations and you start to see the problem. Yes. And it's not just, or it, it, this problem exists across multiple implementations, but it also exists in one implementation across multiple versions, right? So this makes it even more difficult. Yeah. We have multiple versions. We have multiple platforms. There's been cases in the past where 64 bit and 32 bit, uh, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Ds would disagree with each other. Right. So yeah. Um, not to mention Indian, which is mostly gone now, but yeah. So, so there's always going to be this, you know, these issues that we have to deal with. Um, and as you say, multiple versions, right. Um, uh, to some extent across the soft fork, you can always fork off multiple, you know, by definition, you can fork off older versions, but it shouldn't happen under normal circumstances. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, you know, things like that have happened recently enough that, uh, people are still very nervous, um, about upgrades and, and, and uh, taking a very, very softly, softly and, and, and very engineered approach. Uh, to doing that on the network, which, <laughs> which I completely support. It's fantastic. Okay. So now that we have set somewhat of a, of a, uh, foundation for your motivation to work in free software, uh, let's dive a bit deeper into the Bitcoin nuances. And you mentioned that you started your work out with side chains, but then eventually switched to lightning network. Now, what were the downsides or trade-offs of side chains that made you choose in favor of lightning network? Okay. So, I mean, side chains, the side chains that I would have was developing anyway, was, was basically custodial, right? I mean, you know, you could have a quorum and things, but basically, you know, you'd, you'd move it into some custodian system and you were taking that, uh, payoff in return for, you know, there would be this other blockchain that would have different properties that, that would make it move faster and, and everything else, uh, that would be good, good for kind of petty cash. Hence, hence the name petty coin, right? Um, which for me was a kind of interesting trade-off, but, um, but you still had this problem that someone is literally holding your funds, right? Uh, and, you know, you had certain reassurances and there could be a consortium and everything else. But at some point, this, this to me was an uncomfortable trade-off that I was never entirely happy with. Um, now, Lightning doesn't have that trade-off. It has, it has trade-offs, but not that one, which was the first thing that I saw that really convinced me that this kind of thing was, was interesting. And so, you know, and, and perhaps if, if, if Taj and, uh, and Joseph, uh, who were the authors of the paper, um, had, you know, been determined to go implement it and they, they're off running, um, like here's the paper. And by the way, here's our implementations on its way. Then I might've been like, well, great. I'll let them do that. And I'll continue on Bitcoin core. Um, but, uh, but the fact that they didn't intend to implement it, I was like, this, this, this obviously has to exist. Right. I mean, um, this is a fantastic idea. Someone needs to go and implement it and actually make it work. Um, was, was kind of the driving motivation to, to dive into lightning. And with my background in, um, in, in previous like in open source and, and with open specifications, um, it became obvi obvious to me that we needed a, we needed a spec, um, and, and, you know, we needed to coordinate the different implementations because unlike Bitcoin, um, we don't have the same global, global consensus requirements. So we set about making sure that we would have you know, multiple implementations, ideally that new implementations could come along and interoperate and compete. Uh, in that sense and have their, their niches. So I guess that was what uh, appealed to me about the Lightning Network. But it's, it was the same kind of goal. It was like this, hmm, how do we make Bitcoin scale? How do we get, how do we, as, as um, uh, Joseph Boone printed these hats, make Bitcoin great again? And it was partly a joke because of course, in the early days of Bitcoin, you know, transactions were free and everyone trusted each other. So they were fast, right? You just zero comp through and everything else, right? Um, and of course, that was never going to last, right? But lightning brought these promises back. Hey, you know, I can get only in a, in a real way this time, right? Not just an illusion, not a temporary thing, um, that I can get this, this almost instant finality and I can get, 
you know, really fast transactions and, and really cheaply um, was, was, yeah, kind of the, when you first heard about Bitcoin, it was, oh, this is awesome. You know, you can send money around the world free kind of thing. Um, and, and that this was bringing that back. So that, that sort of that make Bitcoin great again thing was definitely, definitely a huge appeal. Yes, it's it's a lofty goal, and I assume that it was a monumental amount of work that you put into, uh, you know, getting to this point where we are now. Uh, so, how about uh, the differences with Bitcoin being th the software itself being basically the specification, right? And then with Lightning Network having multiple implementations that strive to do the same thing. Like, what were different methodological approaches? that you uh, were considering to implement to coordinate all of this well yeah um so i i um so i i believe in you know, the rough consensus and running code thing the ietf model uh of rfcs and having you know people implement the rfcs and they do trade they do bake-offs between themselves they test they work with each other and, and, and you go forward the way the spec process works is that um you uh, you propose a change or something like that, and then it has to be implemented by two independent implementations that interoperate and show that they work together, um, uh, and not vetoed by anyone else. Um, and then it then it basically becomes a formal part of the spec. So uh, that that kind of keeps us honest as far as you, you can't just add stuff to the spec that you, you're the only one who's implemented. Um, and that 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 has been incredibly useful. So as we feel our way through this, uh, the three main contributors to the spec. Are, are, Blockstream, originally myself and now myself, Lisa and Christian, uh, Lightning Labs, obviously, and Async uh, with Eclair and Phoenix. Um, and there are too many cases to mention where one of the other teams has given feedback on something and either made it significantly simpler because they saw something, a different way of doing it, um, or you know fixed a, uh, a bug or made it made it more generic or better. So there's been a huge amount of improvement that's happened just through the spec process and trying to really nail down what's supposed to happen. Um, I have a very opinionated view on how specifications should be written and that's kind of come through in the spec process um i originally chaired the spec meetings um they're 5 30 a.m on a tuesday adelaide time um that's dedication. yeah well someone's gonna get screwed right you've got <laughs> people all over the world and so uh it wasn't gonna clash with anything so uh so that was that was the original uh meeting time now Fortunately, the chairing now rotates, so I hardly ever chair myself, which is great because I can just sit back and you know, drink my coffee and try to wake up uh, while people are discussing things. But it, it was important to drive that kind of early, early process. And um, the spec is designed to be, to, for you to read the spec while you're implementing it. It says, you know, you are reading, if you're reading this, you will do this, 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 this kind of thing. If you're writing this message, you will do this, this, this. So it really is supposed to be something that an implementation spec which unfortunately means the readability as far as like the high level view is sometimes difficult, right? Those of us working in the spec can see it all. But if you just pick up the bolts, as they're called, because we love our lightning puns, uh, if you pick up one of them and try to read it, you'll find it kind of a bit of a, a bit painful, um, particularly when there are additions. Um, so the spec will say, do this, unless this, in which case, do this. So that's always been a bit of tension. C Lightning is the only implementation that actually generates our code from the spec. We There's a tool in the spec uh, directory that will basically parse the packet descriptions in the spec and produce a, a simplified format um, in CSV, so simply comma separated fields. Um, and we have a tool that takes that and generates our C code to create and <clears throat> to print, create, you know, and read all the different messages. So that it makes it easy for when we change the spec. Um, the other thing that we have is a tool where any quote, we, we quote the spec, um, throughout our implementation, which I find really useful because it also means when you're writing things, if you end up implementing stuff that isn't in the spec, you think, well, should, should we mention this, right? If everyone's gonna have to do this, we should probably say that uh, in the spec, you must do this or you should do this or consider this at least. Um, and uh, we have another tool that goes through and finds those quotes and just checks that they match, ignores white space changes and stuff. But basically uh, the quotes in our source should match the quotes in the spec. So when the spec gets updated, we run that tool again and if something has been a change in the spec, we, we fix up our source code. Um, so, oh, great, this has changed. We should now be doing this. Um, we do that every release generally. So, so that, that's really useful for us. We, we were very tied to the spec process. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, I wonder how fluent are the contributions from, from spec to uh, implementation? And you know, in, in, in what flow does it go? Like, is it both ways? 
I, I do I do them both at the same time. I tend to write a first draft of the spec first, um, and then we have an experimental. So we have this whole experimental system in, in C Lightning where we say, right, turn experimental features on and you get all this cool stuff. Um, <laughs> the and, reckless and, and, Yeah, basically. And one of the things is um, you then have, you know, quote from a particular version of the spec, normally you just say bolt 10, bolt number 10, and it goes, cool, I know what that is. But in this case, it's bolt dash, huge Git version for specific extensions. And so I, I write basically the basic spec and then I implement it. And then I, a huge number of fix ups to the spec as I write it, because either I realized what I wrote was dumb or I didn't spell it out enough. Um, I kind of hand waved over things. I don't know. I need to spell this out um, and things like that. So, and I've gotten better at that process over time, but I always implement them together. Um, so that there's, there's almost always uh, code at the same time. For example, splicing, I have spec on the first draft of the spec, but I haven't implemented it. However, I cheated because most of the stuff involved in splicing. So splicing is where you have a channel and you either want to move funds in or out on chain. You basically want to change the commitment transaction. You know, and you go, hey, I want to splice. And it goes, so it goes great. And you go, cool, I want to add this input and I want to add this output. And the other side also gets a chance to kind of throw things in. Oh, cool, I'll add this output, I'll add this input. And so this is this just negotiation of what the new on-chain transaction, which will spend the old channel and basically create a new channel atomically will look like. And that protocol of, of, of negotiation is the same one that Lisa spent so long writing uh, for dual funding, which is the same idea. And you go, hey, Max, let's open a channel and your node goes great. You know, and you can go, cool, I'm going to throw some inputs in as well and some outputs for change and whatever else, which of course is a coin join, right? This is uh, basically a coin join protocol uh, between two peers. So you can do it to, you can already do it to create a, a an opening transaction with C Lightning. Um, and, you know, when I finish this work, I'm basically reusing exactly the same protocol to negotiate on a live, on a live channel. Go, hey, we want to reconfigure it this way. You know, because you want to take funds out or you want to put more funds in. And of course, as we look further down the track and we have things like signature aggregation, um, it becomes extremely attractive, right? If you have cross input signature aggregation, that well, hey, while you're splicing, <laughs> yeah, I'll throw some more stuff in as well, right? Um, because that becomes cheaper. So, but even as it is, it's, it's a good opportunity to do, for you to do fund cleaning and, and everything else. Um, and interestingly, unlike a normal coin join, you have this great ability to go, ah, I don't really want to make that small change output. I'll just top up the channel, just put more in the channel, right? Whatever, right? So you have some interesting flexibility there, which also has the great side effect of confusing on-chain analysis. So, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, but, but that's an example of, of spec work that's been ongoing and gone back and forth over like a year plus, uh, um, Lisa going through the spec changes and then implementing it and then going back to the spec and going, no, that didn't work and everything else, particularly because we did want it to be completely generic, right? You should be able to open a channel in theory at the same time as you're doing a coin join with someone else and have the coin join come out as the channel output. And your peer doesn't know that you're doing that. You're just feeding it all these inputs and outputs that you're actually feeding from somewhere else. That ideal isn't met there, but you can definitely do uh, multiple channel opens at once, right? That's that's the easy case, right? You just talk to all these peers. Um, I tried to open a channel with everyone on testnet at once um, a while back. Most most nodes on testnet are dead because people didn't set them up and then drop them. But I think I still ended up with like something like a hundred opens in a single transaction uh, with every node. I would do it on mainnet if I can't afford it. Um, that would be kind of a cool experiment if someone wants to give me, you know, a couple of Bitcoin to play with. I would happily do that as well. But you know, developing that protocol and making all that work was was a lot of back and forth. And some of these things, you know, nobody's smart enough to just write it from scratch. You really have to kind of oh, have a first draft, try it, go back, and, and just keep iterating until you get something you like. Yeah, so I see. Uh, and uh, d doing this channel splicing uh, or well, no, I think let's first focus on dual funding uh, per se, um, as this is very close to coin joins. And it, or are dual funded channels limited to a two person coin join? Or could we also have multiple people uh, that are in that coin join? Right. So one side could bridge to a coin join. So, um, right. Uh, so say there's Alice, Bob, and Carol, right? At least in theory. Okay. I haven't implemented this. So, you know, the devil's always in the details. But, um, Bob could say, Alice, hey, I want to open a, open a channel. Um, at the same time that Carol goes to Bob and goes, hey, I want to open a channel. And in theory, Bob can go, ah, excellent. Well, every time Alice gives me a new input to add or an output to add, I'll just tell Bob that I'm, I'll just tell Carol that I'm adding that one to hers and vice versa. I'll just like bridge between these two and we will all end up negotiating the same transaction in the end. 
Um, you know, Alice will think, hey, Bob's adding a lot of inputs and outputs, but whatever, who cares? Um, you know, and, and similarly, Carol will think, hey, Bob's doing a lot of work. Uh, but, you know, uh, Bob can intermediate and, and, and negotiate between the two of them and end up with this. And, and in theory, that can extend, you know, indefinitely, right? Um, there could be other things going on at the same time. Uh, you know, this, in this case, you know, I usually think of Alice, Bob, and Carol as lightning nodes, but there could be something else wanting to do a coin join. It's like, cool, I'll be in that, but I'm also going to open a couple of channels while I'm there. Or conversely with splice, you know, it's a similar thing. I want to splice a channel. Huh, okay, well, we could do a coin join in, or we could do a coin join out, um, or even channel close, right? So in this new scheme, channel close eventually uses the same negotiation technique. At the moment, close is basically, give me your address, give me my address, it'll have two outputs. But it doesn't need to be that way. Um, I go, well, I want to close channel with you, sure. Or you say you want to close channel with me, great. Well, at the same time, I'm going to use exactly that same transaction to open another channel and maybe put some funds out to cold storage and maybe do a coin join, you know. <laughs> The kind of the sky's the limit. So yeah, it's not really limited. It's limited. To, it's a peer-to-peer -peer system. So it's it's one party talking to another party, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, but because they could be relaying from other parties, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is just the two of them. Yeah, and so to break down a coin join, there are multiple inputs, right? And these inputs can be from the channel peers, but they don't necessarily have to be. Right? There can be inputs from non-Lightning Network users. Uh, in just single public key coins uh, can be the inputs in that coin join. And then on the output side, again, we, we kind of have the same thing. Like, yes, we can have an output that is a lightning channel um, itself, right? So this uh, multi-sig pre-signed transaction construction. While other, and for this one lightning output, there are always two users uh, that control it. So here it is this peer-to-peer -peer aspect on the output side of the coin join. But again, there can be other outputs that are from other users who know nothing about Lightning Network, who just use single public keys uh, as their base wallet. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly right. Um, and with Taproot, of course, so at the moment, it's quite distinctive when you open a Lightning channel, it's a two of two. Even if you can't see that on the Pado witness script hash side, when it's spent, even a mutual close, um, you will, you'll see, oh, it's a two of two. It's probably almost certainly a Lightning channel. Right. Uh, whereas with Taproot, of course, uh, and Musig, that becomes indistinguishable from any other spend. So in the case where the Lightning Channel doesn't break and you don't have to do a unilateral close or anything, um, in the normal case where you close it, you know, normally, or, or, or you splice it out, you can't tell. Nobody could tell it's a Lightning Channel. Um, now, of course, a lot of Lightning Channels are, are public. So there's another layer of information. If you're actually looking at the Lightning Network, they will tell you, hey, this is a Lightning Channel. Okay, that's that's you know in that case you know, um, and the, even even for private channels which are badly named, basically unannounced channels, there are ways of probing and finding out what those channels are, which is one of the things that we're working on. So it's not as private as we would like, but one of the steps is making it more private on chain would definitely you know win across the board. And yeah, you would definitely have these octopus transactions, which of, about which you would know very little. So how much of additional communication has to be done to negotiate this dual funded lightning channel? And I mean it, especially in the context of a coin join, right? Where let's say we have 100 users getting together. There are certain timeouts for each uh, uh, like step of the protocol that everyone has to succeed by. Otherwise he will be thrown out of the coin join. So how much extra complexity is it to negotiate these channel openings? That's a really good question. So um, the dual funding protocol is aimed to completely displace the existing funding protocol, right? So it's basically mostly because a dual funding protocol where one side doesn't put anything in is basically the old one, right? So we're, we're switching across. Everything will be dual, will be quote dual funded, although in many cases, one side won't put anything in. So, you know, Max connects to me and says, I want a dual funded channel and I'm great. Let's do it. We're modern protocol. And then I just don't add any inputs and outputs and it's all you. <clears throat> but of course I have the option now. But it's pretty fast. So, you know, you basically have add input, add output, remove input, remove output, because you can play around with things. Um, and then you have like a closure phase where you go, cool, okay, we're done. When we both say we're done, because you may not be done yet, you know, then we exchange the signatures on the transaction, the channel transaction that's going to get our, our money back if everything goes, goes pear shaped. So, our unilateral close transaction. Um, and once we've validated those, those and everything else, 
then we exchange the proper signatures for the actual final construction that we've transacted because now we're happy we can get our money back. So, you know, I mean, what's your latency like? It's, it's a reasonably efficient protocol. Um, so as long as you're not, you know, in Australia behind 28 layers of, uh, of Tor or something, and even then I think you'll still be fine. Um, so I don't see latency as being a huge issue, but it'll be interesting to find out what it looks like. Yes. Uh, so latency, not that much of an issue. Of course, there's the online requirement, but I guess that's uh, always assumed for both Lightning and Coin Joins. What one other question is: Do you use some uh, like cryptographic blinding to enhance the privacy during the coordination of the Coin Join already? No. So we looked at things like Poddle, for example. So you would obscure the UTXOs that you're offering. But at the moment, the Lightning Network is not sophisticated enough, and there are a number of papers showing that if you combine the information, you can already tell a lot, that it didn't buy us a huge amount. Uh, Poddle was in the original spec that Lisa wrote, and she had like a trial implementation of it to basically, you would prove that you owned one of these outputs uh, before I would reveal any of my outputs, right? You, you come to me, go, I want to open a channel, and I want you to do a fund in, in as well, um, and you would have to provide a proof to me that, that one of those was real and unspent and everything else. Um, and then I would would publish that out in a way that um, if you tried to reuse that proof for somebody else, they'd see the clash and everything else. Uh, it does add complexity uh, and it's something that's fairly easy to add later. So we didn't do that. So that is a scheme that uh, was invented for CoinJoin, which is kind of cool. The difference is that CoinJoin gives you, I think, 10 different possibilities. Like you can have different variants of the proof. So you can try 10 times with the same input. We don't have to do that in Lightning because if you, it's not like you can't, spend that output anymore it's just that you'll have to you know no one will contribute to your dual funding you'll have a single fund channel if you try to reuse it so even if something goes wrong it's not useless it's just that hey you'll either have to add another input uh, spend it to another utxo or uh open a normal channel that doesn't have you know uh that, that isn't going to be dual funded um but yeah we we chose to excise that from the spec because the spec was already getting pretty big and and we thought, well, you know, this is something that we can definitely add as a requirement later when we see how things actually play out. Um, so we don't have the same requirements um, in that sense. Uh, and yeah, in practice, you end up, of course, seeing what your peer is, peer is offering for UTXOs, and you could abort at that point. I think you're spot on here, right? If this is a two-person coin join or two-party coin join, then obviously the other party will know which inputs you have, right? Because it's the inputs that you do not have. Um, and in order to get that type of privacy protection, I, I, I guess the or one thing to do is to use a larger coin join type. And so a coin join with 100 users where 90 of them are not even Lightning users, um, th then it can become very difficult for the counterparty to find out which channel is yours. And I think at, at that point, it does make sense to add some blind cryptography like zero link uses jomi and blight signatures and no wabi sabi uses heat verified anonymous credentials and this can be then used to make it cryptographically not possible to find out what the input is yes um that would definitely i mean there's a twist there that you want some spare stuff left over to put in the channel and you have to prove that you've got sufficient spare to go into the channel um somebody brighter than me would probably have to figure out how that would all work but yeah certainly um in future, it would be interesting to see something more ambitious like that go forward. Um, but yeah, I mean, even, even as a two-person coin join, the fact that the amounts don't add up um, in an obvious way makes it just, you know, as a step zero, is actually pretty nice for your on-chain privacy. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's basically a, a pay join type, right? Uh, where two users put together their inputs and, you, and this obfuscates the payment amount. But one nice thing is you can make a, a pay join inside a larger coin join. Um, and this gives you added on benefits. So you keep the benefit that the sending amount is obfuscated, but then you also keep the, uh, or you make that defense even stronger because of additional inputs in the coin join, making the subset sum analysis much, much, much more difficult. Absolutely. That's actually a really good point. Um, I hadn't thought of that. So yeah, and one of the things I'm excited about is doing pay join. Actually, was tempted to implement it in C Lightning, even though it's completely outside our scope, um, just because I think it's something that more people should do. Uh, supporting pay join is good. Um, that's interesting. So, so pay join brings us uh, to another um, issue we have with the Lightning Network when looking about privacy, um, and that is the current way when you pay someone something, they, you know, the problem of refunds, right? So today, you know, you give me an invoice, I pay it. 
Um, you don't necessarily know where that payment's coming from. I mean, you know, the, the network isn't, isn't as obscure as we'd like it to be, but the ideal is I know where your node is because you've told me as part of your invoice, but you don't know where the payment comes from and you don't care because, you know, it's not credit. You're actually literally holding the Bitcoin. You're happy. You've got the money. Uh, you don't need to know anything else. Uh, the problem comes, of course, when you want to offer me a refund, right? The normal way is that you contact me somehow and, and I send you an invoice, which one tells you where my node is, right? Um, so that's a leak already. But um, in practice, there's there's a kind of a, a meta question of how do you know it was me, right? Um, you've given out the pre-image, right? So you know it's paid, but everyone along the route has the pre-image, right? Um, you can't just go, well, if you've got the pre-image, I'll assume it's you and I'll give you a refund, right? Because any of the routing nodes will go, oh, cool, I've got the pre-image for that. I'll, uh, I'll claim your refund. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are there are kind of ways of doing this, but my preferred way of doing it is uh, basically part of the offers protocol, uh, which is one of the other things that I've been working on. And that's basically a second layer where an offer is basically here. You should go here to request an invoice. And when you request the invoice, of course, you give it a payer key, which is a transitory key um, that you can later use to prove, hey, I was the one who requested that invoice that I paid, right? Um, which gives an obvious way to do refunds, right? You just sign it with your payer key and they go, cool, well, you must be the one who, who's after the refund. But the other thing, of course, is um, rather than just using private channels as we do today, we use blinding, uh, blinded paths, um, which is something that we're moving to generally, slowly, but but generally in the Lightning Network. This idea that you can supply a blinded path and like, here's here's basically the thing to put in the onion at this point and it will get to, it to the next point that could be routing you through private channels that you don't know about um, or could be routing you through public channels you won't even know. And so that privacy enhancement allows something that people have wanted for a while, which is vendor privacy. You know, you know the, the model in the Lightning Network at the moment is that you know, you know where your vendor is, you have their node ID, you can route to them. Um, you know, and while you can have an unannounced or you know, badly named private channel, you, you know, you announce it in the invoice so people can use it. You say, hey, and I've got a channel from here, you know, and it's this, you know, it's this channel ID, um, which, which is, you know, yeah, um, it, it, it's like a small S secret, right? Uh, if you had to tell some random person who clicked your website that you've got this channel. So really, it's sure it's unannounced in the gossip on the, the, the Lightning Network, but it's still there. Um, so this offers a, you know, a more sophisticated way of doing that. And it has some upsides and some downsides, but, but so this, this offers layers kind of coming with a lot of these, these privacy benefits that I think are really important, including practical ones that people don't really think about, like the refund problem. Okay. So that's interesting. Why do you call it an additional layer? So basically an offer, all an offer does is send an onion message through the, it basically, you know, it, it looks a little bit like an unfinished invoice. It says here, I'm selling this. Here's where to contact me. And what you do, what your software does is basically take that, uh, send an onion message saying, Hey, I would request the invoice for this offer, maybe offering some of the details and you get back the proper invoice and at that point you pay it. Right? So it's kind of a pre-step first, you contact the node and get the actual invoice and then you pay the invoice. So one of the problems we have with invoices is that that pre-image that they promise, you know, the whole here, here's the, the hash and I'll give you the pre-image if you pay is totally not reusable. You should not be posting invoices on Twitter. You know, ideally you send them to this one client and that is their invoice. Um, and that's a huge problem. And there are a few interesting ways around that, but there are other reasons that it's nice to have this second stage. It's nice to have an invoice, uh, but having this first stage that basically is a request for invoice stage, which we call an offer means that it's a static QR code, right? You can just be a static offer. It'll generate an infinite number of invoices. Um, so, you know, you can spray it on a wall you can have a static image on your web page, all those things, and it just works. Um, uh, but also, of course, you know, it gives you all the other cool things that you want from offers like recurring payments, right? The offer says, hey, this is for once a week. It gives you currency conversion. It says, hey, this is, this is five USD. And then when you get the actual invoice, it'll tell you what that is in Bitcoin. Because in practice, this is the way things work. Well, it's usually, you know, if you're a Bitcoin maximalist, it's easy. You just say, hey, this is an invoice for whatever. But for, particularly for recurring payments, people tend to be fixed in a currency other than Bitcoin. And so it's really useful to kind of know that. And the user would approve, okay, cool. You know, I scan an offer for, for once a month at five USD. And it says to me, Hey, that's uh, eight Australian dollars plus or minus 10% each month. And I go, yeah, that's fine. And as long as it stays within those bounds, uh, it will continue to pay it every month and kind of request a new invoice and pay it and everything else. You know, the fact that you've got a payer key means that you can do the refund request for refunds and stuff like that in a much more straightforward and automated way. 
So there, there's there's a whole reason why to have a separate layer on top works really well, even though there may be also other enhancements to to the invoice uh, format itself. Having this offer format is you now uh, is incredibly useful, and so that's already spec'd and implemented. I'm waiting for a second implementation, which will basically mean that we can move forward. Um, the other reason to have a second implementation is that you know somebody who will you know it's good to have somebody poke through the deep details, like when you're implementing it, and go, hey, why did you go this way instead of that way? Wouldn't it be better if we did this? And those kind of ideas. Um, so I'm actually really looking forward to that, um, and it does lift the. I mean, the ways to send people money at the moment on the Light Network are, you know, they send you an invoice or you just key send to them. You just throw money into the void, right? Um, and I really dislike that model of, of throwing money. It, it's really good for the early days when you, you know, Light Network's a network full of friends, right? And you send people money and it's all good. Um, when you look at it like serious commerce and you start thinking about what commerce looks like when there is no middleman, there is no intermediary, you really want your receipt. You really want your proof of payment. You really want to be able to prove that you did or even did not make some payment. You know, the, the oldest piece of writing that we have in existence is actually a receipt or maybe an invoice. Uh, and there's a reason for that. When there's, you've got a cash system with no intermediaries, you want a record uh, that you've actually paid for something. And Keysend doesn't give you that, right? You throw some money and, you know, it, it vanishes and you go, cool, I'm assuming they decrypted it and they took the money, that's fine. But it's terrible for payment for stuff. like. You know, if you have a dispute at some point, even whether, you know, it could just be their software is buggy, whatever you're like, I know I sent you the money, I don't have any record of it, right? The ability to prove that is actually really quite nice. Uh, in fact, in the Blockstream store, we've had, had at least one case where the person proved that they actually had paid. It's like, well, if they pay, they should have this information. And indeed they did. So, you know, I think that's, at this stage in the Lightning Network's growth is kind of underrated. And I think we're definitely going to want that in future. The problem with the, the payment hash is that while I can prove that it was paid, I can't prove that I paid. You end up with the, like the Brian problem, you know, I'm Brian, I'm Brian, I'm Brian, right? Once you've revealed the payment or to anyone in the in the route in between, although um, Scribble Scripts would fix that. Once you've revealed it, right? Hey, I've got the secret. Then everyone's got the secret. Whereas with a payer key, you can prove, hey, I can prove that without revealing the key itself, but obviously just using a signature, uh, that I was the one who requested the invoice. And here I can prove that I, that it was paid. Doesn't matter who paid it now. Like I was the one who had the invoice created. Well, so, you could still share the private key with others. You, oh yeah, you absolutely could, but you don't have to, right? Um, no, this is always true, right? You can always mm -hmm. give, give give information, more information to everyone else. At the moment, you can't. You basically share that pre-image to prove that you paid it, and someone else can immediately, you know, tweet, "Hey, I've got the pre-image. It was actually me, not him," right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, whereas but you don't have this problem with a payer key. So that, that's actually a really nice property to have. Okay, so these offers, I think, try to solve a similar problem as pay to endpoint, or also LNURL uh, tries to solve, right? To have this uh, server address that can be reached to then negotiate the, the, uh, the payment invoice. But where does offers build even more on top of that than pay to endpoint or LNURL? Yeah, so LNURL um, uses, uses a web request, right? Which is definitely like a great first approach. Whereas I wanted to use the Light Network itself. Uh, and there are several reasons for that. Uh, one is that not everyone has Tor, not everyone's using that. And you're gonna be using the Light Network anyway. Um, uh, and the second one is that I wanted to bind it closer to the protocol. There are a lot of really cool things we can do um, if we make, sh if, we, if we basically go, no, you don't actually need, you know, you, you don't need to, to have a Tor web request or something like that. You don't have a separate server running. Uh, your Lightning node will do this for you. Um, so I think it's the right layer to do it. Um, and ideally it will give better privacy, but it also turns out to be a useful probe, right? The fact that I can send a, a message through to the, the, the person I'm gonna be paying and get a response back implies that's a really good start for my first payment, right? Because you might, might be, you know, that might not work and you might go somewhere else, but um, it's like a little bit of a liveness ping. So uh, although theoretically it's slightly higher latency, I think in practice, it could be really useful to have that. Um, uh -huh. So because yeah. the, the communication for this offer is already routed through the Lightning Network with multiple hops, those are the same hops and peers where the payment will be ultimately routed through. So that's already somewhat of a, a probing without actually spending sets. That's right, exactly. Um, now there's a messaging system that people have kind of hacked on uh, by sending fake payments through the Lightning Network, but it's actually quite intensive. Like it used up a reasonable amount of resource uh, to actually like tie up liquidity to do it. 
Uh, whereas this is built on a light, much more lightweight onion message system where you basically, well, this is a message, this is not a payment. Um, so that's also a nice, nice just general improvement to have uh, and pretty easy for, for nodes to implement. Um, so for the first one, what uh, the implementation does is it tries to find a route um, uh, that has through, through nodes that have, have one of those features. And it will probably have a fallback by default where it will just do a direct connection. If it can't, you know, actually find enough nodes that speak the new Onion protocol, Onion message protocol, um, we'll go, well, screw it. Uh, unless you've turned it off, um, I will just make make my own direct connection, which kind of defeats the point, right? I mean, then you're going, oh, the new person who connected is asking me for this thing. What are the chances, right? Uh, it's probably them, um, you know, which might be okay if you're over Tor. Uh, but, you know, that's just a bootstrap mechanism until this thing gets rolled out widely. Uh, that's probably how we would do it. Um, you know, but further down the track, um, there are definitely some things and offers that I'm excited about. One of the things is, um, you know, the, the recurring thing, it's sort of hard for me to emphasize what it should look like, but if you, everyone loves recurring payments, vendors love them, uh, for two reasons. One is you'd have to ask someone every month, Hey, you want this magazine? Do you want to, you know, you want to pay me again? Uh, invoicing someone every month is just a pain in the ass. Um, but they also love them because they're damn hard to turn off. And in the lightning world, there are no, but in a Bitcoin world, there are no pull payments or any push payments. So your wallet keeps, you know, you scroll across, you have the tab of all the ongoing payments you've got and you just go, nope, stop paying that one. <laughs> I'm done. That's out. Um, and that is the level of control that I really want to have. Like, cool. You know, hey, I want to pay Max every week for his podcast. I think it's awesome. Um, but I have complete control over that. I go to my wallet and go, stop paying Max, right? There's no, you know, oh, revoke your access to my credit card to stop me. You direct debiting my account or whatever the hell it is. Uh, current arrangements. So, so I think it'll be incredibly useful. Users will really like it. Um, like uh, recurrent payments are awesome, um, and I think uh, you know vendors will like it as well. Um, probably not as much as, as 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 trapping people into their payments, but certainly I think that this is an approach that will definitely take off. And so I see your wallet becoming more of like a manager of all your stuff, right? So. Um, for example, like the first PR uh, on the offers uh, draft is a request to have compulsory fields. So you can say, cool, you've got to give me your shipping address. Like you're, you're asking me for something, send your shipping address or send your phone number or send your email address uh, in the case of I'm selling you an online newsletter or something, right? Your email address. And there are a few others like that, that, that might be important. Um, and if that's at a programmatic level, it's easy for your wallet to say, cool, they want your shipping address. And you go, uh, uh no, <laughs> or yeah, sure. I'll send them this shipping address. That's great. And so it becomes like a shopping manager of like, you know, here's, here's all the stuff I'm doing. Um, one thing that did not make it in the spec because it could be added later is basically the, the whole shopping cart in the offer, right? So at the moment, you know, you scan the offer, you know, you supply any information that you need, uh, like offer may say a co variable quantity of these things can be order ordered. So it kind of does that, but you request an invoice for that one offer. In theory, you could request an invoice that covers multiple offers. So like much more of the shopping cart experience where your phone scan, you scan this and scan that and scan this and scan that and scan that. And at the end go, yep, send it. And it would, you know, say, Hey, I have a request for the following offers and here's all the details. That would be a fairly simple extension to add. And it would, you know, much more become that, that back and forth shopping experience. Now you could kind of simulate that, uh, without it because lightning fees are so cheap, but in theory, it would be more efficient for you to have one payment that covers, you know, an arbitrary number of things. Um, and in some cases it may matter because it may be, you know, I, I don't want the nuts without the, without the bolts, right? I want either both to succeed or both to fail. I don't want to order one and pay and then go to the next one and pay and it goes, oh, sorry, we're out. Um, so, uh, so in some cases it actually is, is quite useful functionality. But again, it can be added to the spec later and the specs already, you know, you know, it's got significant meat on it. So, um, and the spec, by the way, is called Bolt 12. So Bolt 11 is the current invoice spec and Bolt 12 is the, uh, is the update that builds in offers and things like that. Yes. Fascinating. And I think recurring payments are, <laughs> yeah, they're really a kicker in, in making lightning even more amazing than it already is. Uh, and I see it because this podcast is hooked up to the podcasting 2.0 namespace, and it has my lightning node in the RSS feed. And I do receive payments from crazy listeners who actually like and enjoy the show, right? So this is this is absolutely fantastic. And I myself, as a listener too, am spending way too many satoshis to all the podcasters <laughs> that produce amazing content. Uh, so it's it's a spending trap as well. <laughs> but one of the things that I really notice is that transaction batching makes a lot of sense, 
especially when it's small value recurring payments, like 10 Satoshis every minute. That's just, you know, one transaction per minute is already pushing it. But then when you send very low Satoshi amounts, your percentage of fee rate also increases, right? Uh, so there's a financial incentive for transaction batching. And I would argue there's even a security uh, incentive, at least for now with the current Lightning Channel update mechanisms, where you have to keep some information for every single payment that you make, right? That you want to make less payments so that you don't have to keep gigabytes of backup data that constantly need to be updated. Yeah, so... In practice, the 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 information you have to keep for for old notes is is the old payments is actually pretty low. Um, it's not, yeah, there is some, uh, but it's not quite that bad. I mean, you know, uh, different implementations do it differently, but but our implementations, uh, the Lightning D implementation, is pretty efficient. But uh, but yeah, uh, if you were making, you know, if you're dribbling sats out every minute, you'll start finding that you know, for small numbers of sats, you start going, well, the fees are actually starting to bite now. Um, you know, comfort range for fees is probably 1% or less. Um, and once you start kicking through that threshold, you start to go, ah, really, is this worth it? Um, the problem is if you're paying for something that's genuinely one per minute, um, that's kind of hard. Um, so there's, so in the recurring, there, there's quite a detailed section on the whole recurrence because it's actually quite a hard problem on how you define it. Um, but one of the things you can specify is a pay window and you say, cool, when can you pay? Like, so, so if you think of payment as periods, right? And whatever, once a week, once a minute, whatever it is, you know, uh, when are you allowed to pay for like the second period? You have to wait till it started. Can you, you know, and the default is that you can pay for period N in period N minus one or during period N. Um, so you can pay for period zero and then one immediately, uh, but they can also, the invoice can specify here's your window where you can actually legitimately pay for this and you can make that window really huge allowing for them to pay into the future right so they can go cool yeah look whatever you can pay me way in advance if you want now often you don't want that right um but uh but for something where it's every minute it does potentially make a lot more sense like, on, you can you can actually pay all the way through this now um that would be an obvious consequence if you had this this batchy mechanism you say cool i'll pay this invoice and i want to pay you know <laughs> Periods zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all at once. Um, that would just naturally fall out from that flow, which would be kind of cool, and I hadn't thought about before. But I'm still not tempted to add it to the spec, Max, because it's already getting too big. Um, <laughs> I don't want people to implement it as it is. So we have a really good mechanism in in Lightning for doing extensions. This is a mechanism that I stole from the Linux kernel, um, the EFC2 file system, um, with a slight twist. And basically, you have these feature bits everywhere, um, and uh, the rule is it's okay to be odd. So the odd feature bits, if you don't understand one of those, you can just ignore it. But if you see an even feature bit you don't understand, you've got to go, no, I don't get this. I can't I can't do anything with this. Um, and this gives us a really good way of doing uh, either backwards compatible or non-backwards compatible upgrades. So when we add a new feature, we go, cool, here's a new feature. It gets a pair of bits, an optional one and a compulsory one. And you start by using the optional one and you fall back if they don't negotiate with, with the same bit, you go, cool, okay, they don't understand this, we'll do it the old school way. Uh, but at some point you can go, okay, we're no longer supporting the old style and you set that bit to compulsory. So everyone who supports it goes, cool, that's fine, I understand mm -hmm. that bit. And those who don't give, you know, hey, I got this unknown bit 18. I don't know what that means. And the idea is, you know, people can Google, you know, what's unknown bit 18? And they go, oh, this is new, whatever, you've got to update beyond version seven or whatever it is, right? So we've used that. Uh, generally throughout the the, uh, the lightning process. And of course, um, and the other it's okay to be odd rule is that we have numbered fields inside our messages. And again, if you see an odd field you don't understand, that's fine. But if you see an even one you don't understand, that's an error and you should never have gotten there. And so similarly, we can add these optional things later on and you go, oh, cool, I didn't understand that, that's fine. Um, or later on you turn it on and go, no, no. If you're using an obsolete client, it's time to upgrade. Um, so that's why I can be a little bit hand wavy about, you know, cool, we can do that later, as long as it's not going to be a massive rewrite. And I think that that's definitely something. And, you know, also because I'm, I'm always wary of predicting the future, right? I want to see people using it. I want to see them out there trying things and see what works, what what takes off, what becomes the big thing that people want. Um, and then you go, cool, well, that goes to the top of our priority list. We should definitely do that extension. Or maybe it's never an issue, right? Maybe in practice, podcasts just get used to charging once every five minutes and that's good enough and their fees are low enough that no one ever complains and you're done, right? I don't know. 
Is there a way to give a discount if you make a lot of payments in advance? Uh, yes. So <laughs> the way the offer code works is the, the way the offer spec works is the offer itself has a description, right? And an optionally an amount. So for a lot of cases, the, the offer itself will say, it, it, this is the cost, right? Uh, some cases it's not, it's an open-ended offer, like here, send me some money, right? But normally if this is a cost and optionally, here's a quantity, like you choose a quantity, but the actual invoice, the actual amount only comes at the invoice phase. So that's a guide, but say I want to go cool, but I like Max, I'm going to give him a 10% tip. In the invoice request, I include an amount, which is greater than the amount you want. You go, great, cool. That's what you're getting in the invoice then. Fantastic. Thank you. But you can do it the other way too. I send you, cool, I want this offer. It would normally be this. You can do two things. One is you can set the amount to whatever the hell you want. Right? Cool. If you want to give me a 10% discount just for whatever. But the other thing is you're allowed to change the description. And there's a recommendation that you only append the description, right? Um, it's strongly recommended you only append the description um, because wallets will expect that. And so that special case is handled. So you'd change this, you know, the description would be, you know, Max's podcast and, or, you know, subscription or whatever, um, or, you know, whatever that could be, you know, uh, some item that, that you might buy in bulk. So, you know, a, a kilogram of coffee and I've ordered 10 kilograms and you change the description of the invoice to be, you know, 10 kilo, you know, kilo, one kilogram of coffee, the quantity is 10. You change the description to one kilogram of coffee, brackets, 10% discount for greater than five kilograms or something. So you append the description. You know, on my end, my wallet goes, cool, they appended this to the description and shows the user, right? Um, so you obviously change the price as well, but you can also provide feedback in the description. It can go the other way too. It could be, oh, you've given me your shipping address. I've got to add that or whatever, because you're in wherever, or shipping to Australia. So screw it, you're gonna add $1,300 for shipping. Um, so so there, there's there's a mechanism to both modify the description, uh, which tells them why, and also to change the amount. Um, and that's the other reason this two-step is kind of useful. Yeah, both discounts and tips, uh, absolutely. So this, this basically uh, the similar things that BTC Pay Server does right now. Right. Or, uh, again, things like Allen URL, but it's all done inside, uh, the lightning node itself. Now, what are some ways that you would actually, as a user interface with these features to create these offers? Yeah. So our implementation, of course, it's all command line because I suck at GUIs. Uh, our <laughs> implementation is that you create an offer, um, you can say optional recurrence and set up all these things. Um, and it will automatically the default plugin will automatically, you know, See, you can disable offers as well, um, so you can turn them off, obviously. But it will automatically, basically, uh, turn the request into invoices and things like that, and link them back. So in the list of invoices, you can see, oh, if this is about this offer. That's fine. So it's not too bad. You know, it's a little bit tricky if you have to specify your recurrence. You know, oh, it's every week or every three days or whatever it is for you. If your recurring offers are a little bit more complicated to specify, but they're generally not too bad. When I say recurrence is tricky, so recurrence is sometimes. So there's, there's a standard recurrence, which is kind of like, basically when you first send me the invoice request for the, for, for period zero, that's the start period, but other things are fixed to a calendar. So like there are 12 of these things. The first one's January 1st, the second one's, you know, and you can come in midway, but you're not at period zero. You're at like, you come in in March, you're going to get the March one. Right. Um, and then there's a further twist, which is if you come halfway through a period, do you pay for all of it or do you pay proportional to how much is left? which is a common thing. So there's a bit for that. So there is some, some complexity if you start getting right down into the weeds with that stuff. Uh, but generally it's just a matter of typing. Like, okay, cool. So here's the description of the item. We have a vendor field now, um, which was a mistake in bolt 11. It has a description field that people often just put the vendor in there. Like who's selling it? It's like, no, no, no. That's the supposed to description of what they're paying for, not who they're paying. <laughs> um, and it turns out in many countries to be a legal tax receipt, it has to have a vendor field and an amount and a date and things like that. So, uh, to be a legal receipt. So, uh, a vendor field was actually an addition and I thought that's actually, that's makes perfect sense. Right. So now there's a vendor field. You know, uh, that's, that's actually fun because we have in Wasabi, there is also mandatory labeling for on-chain transactions, right? So this is not lightning, but same concept yeah. that you provide, uh, for each address, a label. And the idea here is to write who knows about this address, who knows that this address belongs to you who can make that link, who is the observer of this address. But people often quote unquote misuse this feature to be the reason for payment. Right? I bought pizza 
instead of from Bob. Right. So yes. th it's interesting that you kind of had the same, <laughs> the same problems, uh, but good to hear that you now have it fixed with the vendor field. Yeah. So the vendor field actually is a really nice, nice addition. Um, and of course the spec says you should put a meaningful description in there. And that's probably the most violated part of the spec that I'm aware of. Um, <laughs> terrible. Like, um, you know, uh, so, you know, hopefully we'll move to something more useful. Um, the other, uh, thing that was considered is there's a reverse description, um, a, a, like a, a payer note. So, um, the, sometimes the person paying it wants something put in the invoice. Um, so, uh, the classic thing would be an offer, which is basically just a tip jar, right? An offer. It doesn't have an amount on it. Give me money. And the description might be, give me money. Uh, but the person who's actually paying it might want to, you know, say what it's for. Hey, you know, I loved your latest, you know, this, this is for episode 21. I thought it was fantastic, whatever. They shouldn't be allowed to set the, the description because the description is, you know, basically what the money's for. So that would be hilarious if you created something and we changed the protocol so that the person paying the offer could say, oh, we'll set the description to this because you don't care about what it is. And I said, it's, you know, sale of ICBM missiles or something, right? And, and then you've signed this invoice to say you're selling me this stuff, right? So having a separate user, user paid field may be another thing that, you know, annotates. But then you end up this problem. You've got to make it very clear in the UE this is something that the vendor will see, right? So, you know, you end up with that problem of, you know, UX, this is your private note for what this is for versus this is something that you're, you're sharing with the vendor. Um, so, uh, you know, like anything, I mean, UX problems are as much uh, a part of refining this stuff as anything else. Yes. And again, that's a privacy sensitive topic, right? Uh, so yeah, but good, good to have this two-way communication. I think that's, that's essential. Oh, so interestingly, you mentioned privacy. So one of the other things uh, is that this signature, the mistake we made with um, with Bolt 11, well, okay, I made many mistakes with Bolt 11. So I wrote, wrote Bolt 11 basically a weekend um, because we needed something to specify invoices, right? Um, <laughs> and it had some interesting ideas in it and had others that haven't worked so well. And we've kind of learned from that. So Bolt 12 does things better. Um, but the signature in, in Bolt 11 is a linear signature of the entire thing after encoding, which is even worse. Um, whereas the signature in Vault 12 is a signature of the Merkle tree with, with actually additional nodes put in so that you can therefore obfuscate parts of the invoice. I can share you an invoice with you, a fully signed invoice, but you know, uh, uh, omit fields. So you can still validate the signature, mm -hmm. but I can prove to you that, you know, I have a signature, you know, I have, a, I have a, an invoice from, from, from Max that, you know, offers me this at this date, but doesn't show my shipping address. It doesn't show my description. It doesn't show, um, the routing hints or whatever else I want to, you know, I can basically selectively, you know, reveal among that. And this is actually one reason I wanted to break up shipping address too. Cause I want to be able to cool. He shipped it to Australia, but not necessarily reveal my, my home address when I'm sharing it with people, um, and stuff like that. And another mm -hmm. interesting factor here that we didn't consider in Bolt 11 was it didn't consider at all is outsourcing payment. So if you're using Strike to pay for stuff, you're giving them your invoice. Now they don't technically need your invoice, right? They just need the payment part. They don't care about the description of what it is you're paying for, but it's all together at the moment, right? You can't kind of give them parts of it and not everything. Um, whereas there's technically no reason that, you know, uh, we couldn't do that with Bolt 12, right? You just kind of, you know, your wallet has all the stuff, but it only sends to them a, 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 a version with you know, the stubs for the, the Merkle tree parts they don't need. And, you know, they don't have a description of what it's for. They don't have a description of, you know, uh, shipping address or other things that, that there are nothing to do with them. I think that's, that is, is kind of a nice to have. Um, I mean, it's possible at the moment to write a bouncer, um, that would basically take an invoice and produce another invoice and then route it through. I actually started writing one, except I started writing it in Rust. And I'm not very good at Rust. It was kind of like, I shall learn Rust while I do this. And so as a result, I neither learned Rust nor finished the plugin. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> I should get back to that and do that with my, in my copious free time. Uh, with, soon. Yeah, soon. Two weeks. Uh, inc incredibly fascinating. Like this is a, this is a massive, I think both UX and security improvement or, or privacy improvement to lightning, like on, on many, many fronts. That, that's awesome. One thing I'm so curious about is what happens if I set up a recurring payment as a sender and then my node goes offline for a while and I come back at a later point? How is the time that I was not online being handled? Right. So 
Um, you can't get you can't get an invoice for oh yeah, this is one of the issues. You cannot currently get an invoice for period n plus one until you pay period n. So the idea is it's a serial set of periods, right? I mean, it, it depends on what it is, right? So for some things, it makes sense for you to just there's no you know particular reason that you have to pay that you have to do zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Um, you can just create a new payer ID and start again, right? Uh, with your recurrence, that's fine. Uh, that's easy. Um, but if you specifically want a series of payments and you want them all linked, then um, there will be a, you know, you can't basically go offline for more than one uh, period, basically, one, one valid uh, payment period, right? Um, you have a little bit of slack there because by default you can pay, you know, during period three, you can pay period three and period four. So you could be a little bit ahead, but you know, and this is kind of fundamental. If you're not online, you can't make your recurring payments. Um, that's a feature, right? It's a feature of any push push system is that you have to be deliberately pushing your payments. There's no way to pull it. Um, now that said, in offer, they could say there's a pay window and let you pay way late if they wanted to, if this becomes a problem. They say, no, no, payment window is really wide. Generally, you don't want that though, because you know, if you've missed it, you don't want to pay for it. Depends on how you how it works out. Um, someone has, it has been suggested that for some things, recurrence shouldn't be by time, but should be by something else. Uh, but specifying that is a complete nightmare, right? Is it like what if you pay per byte? It's like, well, that's a really hard thing to define uh, in in a specification method. And I need to see someone actually, you know, this is one of those things where I want to see how people use it before I try to get too creative, you know. Uh, the, the, the current current recurrent stuff is very much based on concrete use cases that I could come up with uh, and uses from the real world. So it'll be really interesting to see what people do in, in kind of different directions and the way they push this. And that's one thing that's that's that happens is kind of you know um, lightning on the low level there's all this stuff and then people in the layers above just kind of invent this new stuff and that's great. Uh, it's a great way to pull stuff like LNURL kind of like it was a problem that needed to be solved, but. It's also nice to pull that into the, the following a call. Let's 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 get a real spec around this. Let's get let's think about how we would ideally solve this, assuming that we can change anything we want in the Lightning Network. So I'm hoping that we get uh, more, um, you know, because those who are not actually implementing the the Lightning, uh, doing a Lightning implementation, have very little visibility into what's going on with the specs, and that's kind of disappointing because there's some pretty cool stuff in there that's not completely unapproachable that I think. Um, you know, would, would benefit from more review and, and a wider review. And so I'm hoping that, you know, uh, things like offers will make more people doing the upper list. I would go, cool, actually, I read the offer spec and it was readable and it made sense. Um, and I can give meaningful feedback. Here's what I want to do. How should I do it? Like, you know, what's the best way of doing this? So that's one of the exciting things for me is actually seeing people take it, run with it, you know, and, and trip over the, the nasty edges and go, we need an extension here because it doesn't do this or, you know, um, other things that, that, you know, that I might simply have never thought of. Um, tipping, for example, like Australians don't tip. It's not a thing in our culture. So, but it turns out this is not something you can implement later because it's really important um, and, and considered like a fundamental of any payment system uh, in some cultures. So you have to come up with a way of handling that kind of from, from, from the initial thing uh, was actually, you know, was actually surprisingly important. It was one of the first pieces of feedback that I got, for example. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I definitely look forward to that. What about, for example, split payments? That's one of the nice things I like about podcasting 2.0, that I can specify multiple lightning node public keys with a percentage. I'm right? so saying 50% goes to me as the show host, 30% to the guest, 20% to the editor, for example. How about including that in offers? Um, you, you can't really do that. Max. So you can't get a receipt and both have a single payment, uh, not without doing some really clever tricks. So either you want to do really clever tricks at the protocol level so that you, um, you have a front end that pays the back ends. So I pay one payment to you and you're splitting it behind the scenes. Um, and that requires lightning level infrastructure, which is definitely something that we should really be looking at. Uh, for example, like you, you can't redeem the payment without getting secrets from them as well. That would be pretty cool. The other way of doing it is go, cool. The only way you can write a payment to me is go through this path where this path covers the other people who are being paid. And you've basically got to drop, you know, they will take their cut out of the payment as it goes through, uh, which is the other way of doing it. That's better than kind of putting it on the front end and going, cool, you should make these three payments. Um, because, I mean, that kind of works, but it's, it's not atomic. So what happens if, 
you know, I can't reach one of them. And so I pay the others. I'm like, what do I do with the rest of the money? Do I just kind of keep it? Uh, do I try to pay later? Um, when you go to reconcile, you go, oh, hold on, you're screwing me. I, you know, I didn't get my 10% of what you got. You know, how did that work? And, and things like that. Um, the So it's really not, it is not even conceptually a single offer if you're doing it as three separate, completely independent payments. There's no, uh, I mean, you could put it in an offer, but then you'd have to make three requests for separate invoices roll them together and then um uh yeah i'll have to think about that one uh because it is it is hard to see how that works but if that becomes a common use case then you could definitely have multiple node ids in a single offer and it'd be like you should ask these three but the problem is then you really need in the offer to know uh oh no no you could agree to that and so you would take your percentage. So I would basically send all of them and go, cool, I want to send a dollar. Um, and you would presumably send me an invoice for 80 cents and, you know, or, or in Bitcoin, you know, 80 sats. And, you know, one of the other nodes would send me one for 15 and one of the other ones would send me one for five. Um, so, and I would check that they added up correctly and I'd be like, cool, you've, you've sorted that out yourself. That's fine here. We're going to spray it out. Um, that's actually a trivial addition to the spec. We just changed the field to allow more than one node ID. Oh, no, it's not we need more than one route hint um uh okay so yeah not quite a trivial addition to the spec but i mean you know it's certainly a possible addition to the spec um to allow multiple things at once yeah it's, it's one of the features that that i really love i mean just the idea that we, we can reward an entire supply chain automatically because i mean for example one way that this is used in podcast index or podcasting 2.0 is that the wallet creators for example get paid so if you use the Breeze wallet to listen to podcasts and make payments or donations, so to say, then 5% of those go to the Breeze software developers and 1% goes to podcastindex.org, uh, which is somewhat of an aggregator. And this somewhat can reward the entire supply chain if used nicely and correctly. So I think there's quite a lot of potential. Yeah, interesting. And I mean, for me, the important thing there is always visibility, right? I mean, um, I kind of like the fact that you know, I, I said before about the problem of like, well, what if they're not coordinated? I can't reach everyone. On the other hand, it's pretty transparent to have it all in the user side. It's up to the user. Like you say to the user, here's the default. And if they screw with your software or whatever, and they pay different amounts, then yeah, mm -hmm. that's life, right? Um, but it does allow you to kind of express a preference there. The problem is, of course, you're making multiple payments now instead of a single one. And that's, you know, uh, well, there are, as I said, there are ways around that. You can route things through uh, potentially multiple points and basically just drop things. But at the moment, that would just look like a really weird fee. They wouldn't have any trace in their system that it was for a particular thing. There's no, there's nothing more sophisticated there. So I'm going to have to think about that case. Um, but yeah, I do agree that it's nice in that case to have this multiple kind of, uh, this is multiple receiver idea. Um, and I was thinking about extending to have multiple, you know, things from a single node rather than having multiple nodes. So um, I'm definitely going to have to go in and I think sleep on that one. Um, to see what I come up with. Um, but yeah, it is certainly a fascinating use case. Can you walk me through why atomic multipath payments would not work for that? Right? Because here we have already uh, a, we can build multiple routes to the same sender, or sorry, to the same receiver, so that all routes only get settled if all of them get settled or none, right? That's why it's atomic. W why does that not work when we send to multiple receivers? Yeah, no, this is what I was kind of referring to before. If you have, if these receivers are coordinating, so they go, hey, I've got this part of this payment, do you have part of this payment? And they all go, yes, I do. Then they can exchange secrets and all accept at once, right? Um, now they can do that anyway on the back end, but it requires more back end infrastructure, right? These nodes have to be talking to each other to say, hey, if you got your 10% locked in, great, I've got mine, let's go, let's grab it all, right? Um, so you could, but at that point, it's almost easier to go, well, why don't you, um, in a future invoice format using scriptless scripts hand wave. Um, you know, you have a pre-agreement with your two nodes to go, cool, I will give you this this payment in a percentage and you will um, you will give me the secret and then you just present a single invoice and you spray it out from your node um, to them. Um, that may be easier. But, but the interesting thing about AMP actually is you can have, there's nothing stopping you from making, having multiple separate payers. So, so, so multi-part payments, and this hasn't been realized as it hasn't been implemented by anyone that I know of yet, but 
you don't have to have the same node making all the payments. So if you want to split a bill with MPP, it's trivial, right? Any invoice is at uh -huh. MPP can be bill split. You just, you only send part of the bits, right? You send your part, I send my part, we do it at the same time. And as long as, you know, the recipient gets all of them close enough together, they're cool, great. I can take all those, I will do that. Um, so actually you can do bill splitting today uh, in the Lightning Network. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, somebody has to write the code to do it and coordinate between the wallets to go, yeah, okay, we're ready. We're all ready to pay the invoice. Here's how much I'm paying. Here's how much you were paying. Let's go, you know, all that sharing stuff. Um, but in theory, that infrastructure already exists, but this is on the other end. This is the making to multiple payers um, so that they can collect atomically. Um, and that requires infrastructure. This should require a similar infrastructure, but on the receiving end uh, where, you know, you would coordinate with the others, which I don't know, is that is that a worse failure case? If one of them is offline, you don't get your money? Um, or is a better payment case to be like, well, the payer goes, I tried to pay the three of you, but only two of you are online. So it's up to you. And maybe my wallet retries later or something. Yeah, so the way that I think this is implemented in Breeze right now is that if one party is offline, that party does not receive his percentage and the others still get their percentage. So the user ends up sending less Satoshis. Yeah, which I think makes perfect sense, right? That's, you know, hey, get your shit together, right? <laughs> get yourself online, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and the other parties don't get the amount, right, that the other person would have gotten, which yeah. also makes sense. So, yeah, this is a, a nice <laughs> hacky solution and works, right? But, yeah, yeah I think with, with more thinking and implementation, there there could be some cool things done. You know, also considering privacy, because this is somewhat somewhat analogous to CoinJoin, right? We merge transaction graphs in for both the sender and receiver, right? There are multiple senders in the transaction and multiple receivers in the transaction. Now, having this type of, you know, split sender and split receiver, it's very different, but it's it's similar in some analogies. Yes. Yeah. Um, particularly if you had the system where your wallet would drop, would drop payment on the way through. So you basically pay it in a large fee. Mm -hmm. It's something in the onion to tell them what it's for, right? That's definitely a possibility. I'm trying to think whether you can use scriptless scripts to do decorrelation and get some magic there. Uh, I don't think so. I think you end up just going cool. And, and on the way, as long as the final recipient accepts it, you will get your tip, right? And then I can, you know, maybe if that doesn't work, then I retry and just pay you directly. But potentially it's an optimization rather than doing multiple payments. If you go, cool, I can actually route more cheaper than I can route to all three of these. I can route through A to get to B and do like one we on one big payment in that way. Um, would, would be kind of cool. Um, in that yeah. case, I would not have proof of payment that I have paid A, however, right? The only proof will be that I that, that B got the payment. Um, so there's a potential issue there. Uh, but you know, again, it depends. Um, if a and B have an array agreement where they will fee split. So, so when I thought about this originally, I was thinking that, you know, say A wants to take 10%. So A is your agent, right? And they're like, cool, everything that pays to B gets to go through A and A is going to take 10%. And behind the scenes, when B gets the receipt, they're like, oh, cool, I've got this payment coming in. They would ping A and go, hey, are you, are you holding 10% of this? And they'd go, yes, I am. Or no, I'm not. They go, no, I'm not. Like, well, I'm not touching it then because you haven't paid my agent. Um, and if they are, they go, great. Not a problem. Um, now that kind of solves your problem because then you go, well, B gave me, they B accepted the payment. So it's up to them to make sure they paid their agent because that's how it was supposed to work. <laughs> you know, um, so I no longer have this problem, right? I can simply drop a payment on the way through. But for more complex scenarios where you're paying three people and stuff like that, you start to go, well, I'm not sure I want to have this Mongo payment wending its way through the Lightning Network um, and multiple points of failure and, and, and what happens uh, and, and see, in that case, uh, you can't handle the vendor A being down, right? Because you've told it, you know, all payments must go through this. Um, and I don't mm -hmm. think that's acceptable. So, so for something like this, I don't think that's the right solution and, and, and something similar to the current basic. Just just make three damn payments, maybe with an optional optimization to drop, you know, drop things on the way if you can. Uh, but I think your base is going to be, you know, make, make, make three payments at once. Is it possible to add a regular on-chain address, a single pub key, as a fallback to a Lightning offer in the case that the Lightning node is offline? No. Um, it can be added to an invoice, but you need to get the offer into an invoice. Um, mm -hmm. So it's added an invoice the same way that we have fallbacks for, you know, for both 11 invoices, we have fallbacks for both 12 invoices. It's the same thing. Um, but an offer is generally not mappable straight to an invoice without talking to them because it doesn't have a doesn't have the, 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 the payment hash, I mean, for a start. Um, and that's, that's probably the key one. 
Um, so if they're really offline, you can't get the invoice out of them, right? Um, now, another thing you've got dropped from the spec is the ability to redirect and say, cool, hi, um, I have a signature here proving that I'm authorized to, you know, a, a canned authorization from the node that you were trying to talk to to say, yes, I can, I can give you an invoice instead, right? So it, it helps if you're doing migration, like cool, company A buys out company B, but they still want to accept all company B's offers and stuff like that. So you have, you know, things like redirects, hey, here's your offer, actually that's obsolete or whatever, or yes, we can redirect all of it and here's the signature and all that stuff. So you, future infrastructure could allow you to do things like this. So you would have someone who would issue those things on your behalf if you were offline. Um, now, obviously that would be something of a trust issue at that point, right? Um, so you would need firstly to prove, you, you would need to give a, you know, the, the node would have had to pre-sign something to say, yes, I'm, they're authorized or they're authorized for this particular offer or some subset, right? Um, and that's the way it would probably go forward. Um, because again, you know, if somebody else can, can take your payment, then what's your invoice? What's your receipt actually worth? <laughs> I paid someone, great. Well, that doesn't oblige me to anything. Um, so it's kind of a natural tension there uh, between I need your actual signature on it, which means you have to be online in some sense. You could pre-generate a whole pile of these and leave them with someone, but in order to then accept the payment, uh, they are going to need to know the uh, the pre-image. Um, and again, that's that becomes a trust issue, right? And to actually take the money on your behalf, obviously, um, you need to have trusted them to some extent. So, you know, there are things we can work around at the edges, uh, but the fundamental assumption of the Lightning Network is that you will, in some sense, be online to receive payments. Um, and, you know, uh, I think that's you or your agent, in some sense, uh, will be online to accept payments. And I don't see how that can change if you want from the vendor a proof that you paid. Does the offer also include some form of communication about opening a new channel? No, I didn't do that. Although it's it's kind of a um, it's a really common thing to do at the moment. I think that will fade um, in the long term because Lisa will probably be talking about this next month. There's an old idea called Will Fund for Food. It's like a uh, <laughs> it's a bit um, that was proposed in the Adelaide Summit, which is now like over two years ago, um, which oh. is basically doing something where you say, "Hey, and by the way, I will here's my rate card for this rate. I will." I will fund fund a uh, transaction for you, and that goes out on the network uh, as part of your 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 node announced gossip, and people connect and go, "Cool, I want to, you know, I want to pay you to to open a channel with me." Um, uh, and I think that open marketplace will end up taking over that whole boutique offer thing. If you want someone to open a channel with you, you'll basically go, "Cool, I will pay you for that." Um, and I think that's that's a more logical way to do it. The only case where that's an exception is that if I don't have any lightning funds. Then how do I pay to like okay, how, how do I pay you to open a channel to me? Uh, I think the answer is get some lightning funds, um, and increasingly that's getting easier, right? So more people are on lightning, so you don't really have that bootstrap problem of I've only got on-chain Bitcoin and I need to to get capacity. So I think that need will is, is sort of a boutique thing, but hey, I could be wrong. Maybe that's a big thing. In which case, you know, um, it's easy to add a feature bit and say, hey, this is actually a representation for a, a channel open. Um, as part of the offer. Well, I mean, we still have a very small amount of Bitcoin users compared to global population, right? And yeah, a tiny fraction of Bitcoin users are also Lightning users. So I do think we will have a massive amount of onboarding still left. Uh, so yeah, maybe yeah, it's it's worth something to consider. The onboarding won't come from Lightning from, from Bitcoin users, right? The onboarding will come direct from non Bitcoin users. Uh, the, the real big onboarding will be that way. Um, it won't be people opening their cold storage in order to like go into the Lightning Network. That's just like, I don't think that's how it's going to happen, right? I genuinely, you know, again, predicting the future is dangerous, right? But I think, um, you know, we will see people, you know, things like Strike or things like that. Most people will come on from direct from Fiat to Lightning. Uh, Leapfrogging. Some, yeah. Yeah. And we won't go through Bitcoin. Um, you know, I see people setting up stuff on Lightning becoming successful, having lots of incoming and then going, huh, I've got way too much capacity. I need to like bleed some of this off into my cold storage. Like, you know, here, learn about cold storage. Here's, here's a, you know, here, here's a treasure or something or a cold card. And, you know, uh, and that's where you should be sending your funds. Um, so uh, I definitely see people going that way. 
but you know, if, if Lightning is being built just for the Bitcoin community, uh, then that's I think too, thinking too small. Uh, mm -hmm. And I expect it to be, you know, um, and also it, it is not a huge overlap. So the current narrative in the Bitcoin world is very much the like store of value and you know hodl and everything else, and you know this harkens back to like a, a, a very different narrative, which is about you know spending, you know about about sort of borderless payments and stuff like that. I think it's always been there, but certainly isn't the emphasis at the moment. So, you know, I, and I think, you know, naturally you get a HODL store of value turns into a, and now I actually have too much and I need to spend some uh, for some reason. Um, and then the light network is ready for you at that point. Um, but I still think we're going to probably see this, 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 this going straight onto lightning kind of migration, which I think is kind of cool. And I feel that are, are kind of struggling with, with kind of, oh, I have Bitcoin, but I don't have lightning is kind of like a very small subset of, uh, of the population. Yes, I see. So what do you, like, how do you envision then for a complete new user has no Satoshis at all, and he wants to, well, first receive Bitcoin in the lightning network. How do you do that in the future? Yeah, so I mean, Phoenix Wallet does this today, right? I mean, they basically open a channel on demand when you do your first receipt. Um, and to some extent, I mean, that's trusted because you're trusting them to open the channel with you um, as part of the receipt of payment. Um, but it's a reasonable bridge to kind of, you know, a UX bridge, right? To kind of get you across that that whole del initial delay. Um, but I do think, you know, the the um, in the short term, there will be basically the classic buying users model. Like, you know, we, the, people will fund channels to you because they want you as a user. Some of that will come out of exchanges and other things like that. Where there'll be, you know, okay, we'll create a channel to you. I've always liked the introduce to a friend thing. I mean, I always did that with Bitcoin. Like, someone was shooting interested in Bitcoin, I'd send them, set them up in a wallet and give them five bucks of Bitcoin, right? Um, it's, we've got the pieces in place uh, to have a similar experience with QR codes where, like, the fund a friend model, really like, cool, I'll open your first, you know. See, the thing is that, that I mean, trivially, of course, you know, I can set you up with a Lightning wallet and you, I can open a channel to you. But, I may not be the greatest, you know, my phone may not be the greatest lightning node that you want to connect to. Um, so the ability to fund a channel for you from someone else for like five bucks or something uh, would be kind of useful. And we have the pieces, but it would be a matter of like UX and, you know, scanning QR codes and stuff to actually make it a standard to make it work. Um, but it's kind of been pushed to the background because of things like Phoenix, where basically wallets will open a, uh, a channel to you on demand and, assume, and hope that the fact that you're receiving a payment implies that you're um, you're, you're going to be using the light network, right? Um, so when you first install the app, they don't open a channel to you. They do it when you receive a payment, um, or send a payment. They go, cool. Okay. At this point, you're serious, right? Uh, we're going to, to kind of start funding that channel. So yeah, I, I kind of see, I think there'll be some of that happening. Um, but yeah, it will be interesting to, to see that kind of roll out. Um, and I, I do think there will be a certain amount of like buying users by basically eating the cost of funding the channel to them um in the, in the kind of early days yeah and i'm very curious how this will further evolve if we really have a lightning network inbuilt channel opening uh kind of fee rate that people offer or charge that that, that will change the equation quite a lot yeah absolutely um and i think that that's going to be really interesting um so yeah i don't want to steal lisa's thunder on this because i know she's working on it right now so i'm hoping that that there'll be a you know she'll make a big splash when she's actually got an implementation of that, uh, and the spec out. Um, cause awesome. I, I think, it, I think an open, open, um, uh, an open marketplace for that, um, is, is going to be a real game changer. Uh, back a bit to orders. Um, uh, sorry, offers. <laughs> uh, what about huddle invoices? They are somewhat of a cool functionality, but always seem to me a bit hacky. Is that feature more uh, adequately satisfied with offers? So huddle invoices, um, yeah, interestingly, so huddle invoices are played on the network and will eventually be banned. That's pretty clear. Um, <laughs> because I mean, basically you're holding up liquidity uh, for an indefinite period of time, right? That's a spam attack uh, waiting to happen. Um, we've supported them in C-Lightning. We have a hook where you can basically delay things for as long as you want while you sort stuff out. They're kind of nice in, I mean, for a technical reason. You often want to do just-in-time invoicing or something, right? Just because I've offered you an invoice doesn't mean I'm ready to take your money. And at the point I actually accept your money, I want to make sure the back end is ready and everything else. And I've actually got the stock, stuff like that. So that's why we put it in and it is a useful thing to have. Um, but this whole, no, 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 we'll just wait while something happens. Um, 
we are, you know, this has been on discussion for quite some time on how we handle spam on the Lightning Network. But it seems whatever method we end up using will end up meaning that you can't just have a HODL invoice that you hold for longer than some fairly short period of time, I imagine, like you know, a minute or so. Beyond that, penalties will start to apply. Uh, now, of course, everything's negotiable, right? So one, one option would be to basically, you send a small payment through that basically flags and says, hey, there's this other associated payment that's gonna come through and it is gonna be high latency. It's gonna be, could be well be open for an hour and you basically prepay fees. You send two payments, you send a small one. And once that's gone through, everyone's like, yes, I'm happy to hold that liquidity for you for an hour if you want. And then you can send your HODL invoice and there'll be no penalty. So there will be a mechanism of doing this kind of thing. But just as a, as a rule of thumb, if your business model is counting on HODL invoices today, get ready because you know at some point the network will start banning them. Um, and that was, I think I said exactly the same thing at my, uh, um, my talk uh, at Berlin, in fact, um, that this, this kind of you know, ability to indefinitely delay uh, accepting a payment is, is you know, at some point becomes an attack on the network that we're going to have to mm -hmm. address. So, uh, so now Offers doesn't specifically grant you anything to do with uh, HODL invoices, but you, know, you could do them the same way you could do them before. Yes. So w one thing that I would like to hear your thoughts on as well is how light, uh, sorry, how Taproot can improve a lightning network. And I, I think the obvious ones, uh, and we've already talked about them at the join, there was a because podcast in the past is that music will aggregate multi-signatures to look like single signatures right? and then adapter signatures will make hash time lock contracts look also like public keys and signatures basically. Um, so at, at first, what do you think about these two uh, improvements of Taproot? So hash time locks looking like normal, I, they only in the success, it's kind of in the corner case where they succeed, where they fail and time out, you still end up going through the script path and it's pretty obvious. Um, I don't think they'll be well obscured in the lightning case if you have multiple of them. It'll still look like a weird pattern, I think off the top of my head. I mean, we'll have to see when we actually get down to brass tacks. Um, but yes, the ability to basically have a multi-sig look like a, a single sig is, is key that just wipes out a whole heap of differentiators which is just which is just awesome uh, the other one is actually payment decorrelation so at the moment um a payment is uh, you know an invoice says hey here's the i will give you the pre-image the thing that hashes to this and that's literally the contract that you sign and hash done the contract the problem is it's the same contract across the network so if it goes through alice bob carol dave all of them can trivially correlate the payment because it's for the same pre-image, right? It's literally the same HTLC going through. Um, if we switch to using points or scriptless scripts, then you can tweak them at every point. So um, if Alice and say, well, Alice and Bob, obviously they're sending to each other, so no, but if Alice and Carol are, you know, uh, are run by the same person and they're trying to correlate payments, at the moment it's trivial. They can tell, cool, this is the same payment going through. But uh, with scriptless scripts, you can have a tweak at every point. It can be a random tweak. Um, and so if you don't see every single hop, you can't tell, you can't trivially tell um, using using the pre-image. Um, you can just tell, hey, we're, it's after some, the, the script of script thing, it's after this point, uh, but I, I, I can't tell that this is the same point that was asked two hops back. Of course, there's still timing, there's still the amount, there's still the delay that's left. Um, there are other things that, um, you can do some statistical analysis and kind of figure it out, but it's certainly not the trivial thing that it was or is at the moment. And we call that payment decorrelation uh, because it means they're decorrelated across the path. The other cute thing, of course, is that with MPP as well, multi-part payment path payments, um, you can obscure it in different ways as well, right? Um, in fact, people have talked about doing like this weird ass MPP where your nodes will actually split payments for you or even combine them back again. Um, to, to obscure the amounts and everything more. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's a lot of engineering and I don't know how how much we'd gain out of that. But certainly the payment decorrelation is something we've talked about from from the beginning. Like uh, this was, this I think was discussed in Milan, the very first uh, lightning summit. So um, that's definitely something that we want, we've wanted for a long time. So just that alone um, will make us feel a little bit better about our privacy of payments across the network. One of the other improvements that I would really like to dig down on, especially because you mentioned previously that the so-called private non-announced channels uh, certainly can be improved in privacy by quite a lot. What do you think about these ideas to use um, Schnorr ring signatures 
to prove uh, uh, the, the channel? Maybe can you explain how, how that idea works? So uh, I can vaguely from a high level. At the moment, to, to announce to the, uh, the network that you have a channel uh, that can be used for routing, you actually prove that you own a particular UTXO on the network. In theory, it's kind of like a privacy leak. It's like, well, it would be nice if you could just say, hey, I have some capacity and that's it. The reason we, did, we tie it to a channel is simple anti-spam, right? Um, you have to have some money on the Bitcoin network to spam the, your, your announce across the, uh, the Lightning network. All the hard cases in Lightning, we offload to the Bitcoin network. Your, your chain, you know, your, your, your channel has problems, whatever, your, partner, your, your peer is about to time out, whatever, you, you go onto the Bitcoin network, right? And we do the same thing for our gossip. It's like, well, for example, you can't announce a node without a channel. You can't announce a channel without proving you own a UTXO. So there we go. That solves our spam problem. Um, unfortunately, proving that you own some subset of UTXOs doesn't do it for you because you can't constrain that. Um, so if I prove to you that I own a UTXO in this block, well, I think as far as I can tell, you can produce an infinite number of proofs that you own a UTXO in that block, more than there are UTXOs in that block, um, and use that to span the network again. So it doesn't actually benefit us in that way. Um, now, are there other ways that we could anti-spam? Quite possibly, right? Um, we could we could require some kind of different proof, perhaps, or uh, or simply use other other techniques, right? And say, cool, you can, you know, um, sure, you need one channel, but then you can announce other channels without actually revealing anything else or something like that. Um, but to some extent, we've shortcut a whole heap of spam problems by requiring you to prove on-chain ownership at the beginning. Um, so, uh, so yeah, the only reason that, that these things are, are um, well, no, there's a secondary reason. And that is that because we all have this blockchain that we all share, it's a really compact way to refer to something uh, because you can basically say this block, this transaction, this output, and that uniquely identifies uh, a particular channel. So we can fit it quite neatly in 64 bits. And that makes our, you know, uh, our gossip more efficient and things like that. Um, so that's the other reason, but that's secondary to the fact that we use it for anti-spam. So there's many ideas on how to, on, on getting rid of it, but nobody's kind of come up with a good way of doing it and still stopping people from spamming the network. I see. That's an interesting trade-off that I did not articulate like this before. Um, is the channel outpoint also used in the creation of the route from the sender? Yes. Yes, you literally say, here's the next hop, and you just express it as the outpoint. Um, there's a proposal to allow you to do a node ID as well. It's basically an alias for the node ID, but the node ID is is, is bigger, um, which was originally a concern, and these days with our variable size onion probably isn't. In fact, onion messages explicitly can use either. You can specify the next hop either as a short channel ID or just as a node ID. So it, it basically the, the, the short channel ID is a shorthand for for, for where you want it to go next. And the short channel ID is the out point. It's literally the block number, the out, the, the, the transaction number within that block, and then the output number in that transaction. But so then even if we would have these Schnorr ring signatures to, to prove that we would own some of these uh, outputs, how, like, how could you then create a route through this node if you don't know exactly what out point they have? Oh, you would just specify and get get this payment to the next hop and that's this node ID. Um, you know, presumably it would have said, I have a channel to this other node. You need that for routing, um, but you wouldn't know anything about it, um, you know, other than what they tell you. Um, uh -huh. So the, the sender tells the routes only to route to the, or to send the money to that other node, but they, the sender does not need to tell the routing node through which exact channel that has to be done. That's true today, actually. You can have multiple channel, uh -huh. redundant channels between two nodes. And they specify one of them, but you just use that to indicate which direction you're going and you don't actually have to obey it. You know, they can't tell, right? <laughs> I mean, you know, um, it's just a shorthand for the next, the next node ID. Okay. So what do you think is missing before we can have more private, private channels? So, um, so there's, there's a couple of things for privacy. There's, there's actually quite a lot. So, um, um, we need this, um, and, and we have a spec for this. Um, we need this blinded path. And so the, the idea with a blinded path is I provide you with these uh, encrypted things to put in the onion, and you have to lay these in the onion. And that is only decryptable by that particular node. It decrypts it and goes, cool, I know where this is going next. And so you have to put these in. And it's just 
specifically implement it so that if you skip one of them, it doesn't work. Uh, there are some tricks here, of course. If you hand out one of these things in your invoice and say, cool, you must use these, these encrypted secrets to get to, to, to me, uh, whoever me is, right? I'm, I'm hiding behind these, this, this shield of like these things. Um, there are a couple of things is you have to obviously not accept it if they try to use that invoice in the clear or through any other method other than the one that you specified, right? So if it didn't come with that encrypted blob because each one rolls, so you'll basically get the, you know, this one will decrypt to the next one, to the next one. So you can tell that they use this properly. Um, if they do anything else, you obviously pretend that you don't know it, right? Because otherwise they can probe and go, hmm, I wonder if it was Max who sent me this invoice. And they send it to you in the clear and go, hey, can I pay this invoice? You go, sure. And then you're like, okay, well, it's you. Um, so, uh, so there are a few tricks in that implementation, but it's not too bad. And I have a draft implementation of that as well. Um, and Declare are looking at it. Uh, too. So we have to do some more checks on the crypto side and everything else. Um, but that's key for vendor privacy. Um, and, and a quick aside here. This is basically rendezvous routing for the entire, for the entire route, or it's, it's more, it's a more holistic approach than rendezvous routing. Uh, so, you know, so this is separate. This, this is basically to hiding the vendor. So the person you're going to. So at the moment you say, Hey, I've got this private channel from, from this dude or or even a series of private channels in theory. So here's a route to use to get to me, but you still know who I am and that leaks a reasonable amount of information as well. Um, whereas this is like, here's an encrypted path to get to me. And ideally then what will happen in future is that we would disallow routing through unannounced channels unless you're using an encrypted path because that encrypted path can only have become from um, the, the person at the end of the path basically. So, so, um, then they can basically say this, this is, you know, um, we can, we can cut off that, that hole at the moment where you can try to probe through, um, Hmm, I think this, this might be your channel and try to probe through somewhere, uh, and detect it. So, so that that's required for, for basically having uh, vendor privacy for the sender privacy. There's so, so the trampoline routing solves a slightly different thing. The rendezvous routing stuff is basically, so, so normally, you know, your node looks across the network and it goes, cool. How do I get this to wherever, um, either. How do I get it to, uh, e even in the case of vendor privacy, the vendor path ends up at some node and I have to get it to that node and then use my encrypted path to get it through. Or if I'm just sending it out to some node, I need to get there. For light nodes, they often don't have enough uh, information to, to, to know the whole routing table. And certainly as lightning grows, that's gonna become more and more difficult, particularly in the case of like a mobile app. And the, the Clara guys talk about this really well. Um, basically people open the app and send a payment. Well, you know, when you open the app, it starts trying to sync the network and get the information that it needs to send the payment. And it's too late by the time it kind of starts doing the gossip stuff and everything else. That's like, they want the payment to go through now. Um, <clears throat> so what they want is, you know, the, the trivial way is you go, you have a server somewhere, you go, Hey, how do I pay Joe? <laughs> no reason. I'm <laughs> just, just asking. And then the next payment goes out to Joe, right? That, that, that's a trivial, uh, you know, a trivial information leak. Another way of doing it is to send to some node on the network that you do know how to get to. Uh, cool, can you send this to Joe? And normally, of course, you only give them the next hop. In this case, you go, cool, here's an extra payment and I want you to route it to however, you know, wherever Joe is, right? wherever this node ID is, just get it there. Um, create the rest of the hops, do the thing. Um, and um, now in that case, of course, I still have to ask, hey, how do I get to the rendezvous node, right? How do I get to one of those? Um, and then let's tell the rendezvous node where it's going, but I could chain these, right? So if I don't want the rendezvous node to go on paying Joe, I could go through, that's the rendezvous node to go to another rendezvous node and tell that one I'm paying Joe. So, you know, the rendezvous node may see where, guess where the payment's coming from, or, you know, I'm whoever I'm asking for the route knows that I'm going to the rendezvous node. The rendezvous node co collaborates with them and then they know, haha, um, right. Well, I know it's going to Joe and I know who asked for the route to you, so therefore we can figure it out together. Um, so basically, it's effectively our, like like the Tor network. Um, at the moment, you can only have a randomized route between any things that are connected by channels. This is another layer up, which allows you to send over arbitrary numbers or channels between peers. Um, it makes you know obviously you're sending potentially a lot longer path, uh, but it does allow you to protect your privacy. And this is a this is a service that. Uh, that nodes would charge for, right? They could charge for this, uh, this, this ability to route for other people. Um, so it does allow you to outsource your routing is the whole, whole point of this, uh, this exercise. And there are a few interesting proposals on that with uh, the async people kind of leading the charge there because this is, this is a, a hot issue for them. Um, 
they, they would like to, to not be exposed to that information um, and have as many nodes as possible out there offering these kind of uh, services. Yes. Again, I hope that we will see more and more of these lightning service providers um, or these lightning services being provided by everyday nodes uh, just uh, to well connect themselves and each other. Uh, optimally, uh, I, th I think there's a lot of more cool, crazy complex things that, that can be done that just needs a lot of work to actually figure out. Yeah, absolutely. Fascinating. So Rossi, we, we, we covered a whole bunch in our conversation here, but, but is there anything else that you're still eager to speak out? I know. I think I, I find this whole space really exciting and I'm, I'm kind of a low level kind of bits and bytes kind of person. So I can get lost in the weeds of like, okay, how are we going to implement this and everything else? But there's this whole stack above, right. Of, of you know, I mean, you, you talked about the, the, you know, the podcasting stuff and things like that. People, but what's really exciting for me is people building stuff on top of this, uh, the building the higher layers and, you know, getting stuff to work, um, and, and using this kind of, uh, and, and deploying it to real users. Um, that's definitely not my strength and something that, you know, uh, but it always surprises and impresses me when people do that thing. And, you know, I learn a lot and I really appreciate the feedback because often we find people have worked their way around something where if they just, if we just even knew that this was an issue, uh, it's something that we would address either at the implementation level, like the lightning node, or often the spec level, like this is something that we can spec out and go, cool, we should have a way of doing this and we should have a standard way, damn it. So that everyone doesn't have to implement some boutique hack. We can actually design it and make sure that it's, you know, it's, it's a standard thing that everyone, everyone's going to support. So I guess that's the takeaway is that I would, you know, I always love it when people, you know, tell me their problems, right? Um, tell me the issues that they have um, and what they're trying to do. And so we can often, you know, work out the way to make sure that we're doing that. Uh, it's because, you know, the spec still moves and it's still, it's still evolving and still going onwards. So obviously we haven't had a face-to-face -face meeting in a while, but there's, you know, there's hope that maybe later this year, there'll actually be another face-to-face -face lightning spec meeting, um, which we would expect to definitely kick things into high gear uh, on that. So. Yeah, you know, I guess that that would be my takeaway. If you're if you're working on doing stuff with the Lightning Network, make sure you're you're reaching out to your friendly Lightning developer and making sure they know uh, what you need. <laughs> yes, that's great. Uh, no, and it's it's really been a blast to to see how Lightning has evolved from a concept to the very first reckless implementations, and to now really this 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 thundering uh, ecosystem already. And, and we're just getting going. I mean, we've we've outlined in this conversation 101 things on of how we can make lightning even better. <laughs> so I, I'm hopeful that this rigor to improve lightning will will continue to be there. And I, I think it's a it's a massive opportunity, as you say, right, to bring free and open source money uh, uh, in a way that it is both you know usable as a store of value where you can verify that nobody is printing more money. And simultaneously, you can make payments that not everyone has to verify. <laughs> like this is this is a, a ridiculous achievement, and I'm I'm happy that we have some wizards like you uh, on board to help us. We'll figure out how to get it done. To be fair, I must say that um, I, I'm probably down the older end of the spectrum of, of Lightning developers, um, and it definitely keeps me on my toes, keeping up with all the the, the exciting and um, and novel things that that. Um, that other people come up with in the space. So, um, so yeah, it just definitely, it's certainly keeping me, keeps me getting up at five 30 in the morning, uh, for the calls. And I've never done that for any other job. So <laughs> that's, that's just how exciting I find this space. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Really. It's, it's a physical excitement and, uh, bullishness that it actually hurts. <laughs> and yes, waking up at five 30 is, is one of those symptoms of just being knee deep into Bitcoin. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Excellent. Well, Rusty, thanks again for coming on the show and uh, keep up the great work. Talk to you later. Excellent. Thank you, Max.